Assalamu alaikum, this is Dr. Mona al author of the Muslim Narcissist book and empowerment coach for Muslims. Today's podcast will be part two of the previous podcast about childhood traumas caused by malignant narcissists and psychopathic Muslim parents. So today's one will be about the malignant, narcissistic and psychopathic Muslim husbands and wives. So I'm going to call these people narcopaths because they are a combination of high-level narcissists and they are borderline psychopaths or they are full-on psychopaths. So basically we are talking about people who are very high up there in their narcissism. So again, I'd just like to warn people this does come with a trigger warning because I will be talking about the horrific abuse that these people put their partners through, okay? So... Just wanted to warn you, if you're not ready to listen to it, then please don't. And if you do need help, one-to-one counselling and coaching, just reach out to me. My email is below, so just send me a message with a brief about your case and I'll get back to you, inshallah. And as always, I'd like to kindly ask you to like, share and subscribe to this channel. There's so much more content coming that you do not want to miss out on. So do hit that bell icon so you can be notified about the future podcasts in Charlon. So let's get cracking with this one, which is not going to be an easy one to record, but I pray that Allah makes it easy. So as I've said in previous podcasts, the narcissist slash psychopath, the narcopath, is someone who is controlled by their qareen. They are enslaved to their qareen. Now, an important message I would like to send out to everyone who is narcissistic who is listening to this podcast today is that the qareen is not your friend right he or she is your companion but they are not your friend so they will sabotage you in the process of you sabotaging the lives of everybody else and they do that by making sure you have nothing good in your life so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might bless you with an empathic husband or wife beautiful children, a wonderful career, and you self-sabotage all of that, right? You self-sabotage it by abusing everyone who is under your care, and you will sabotage your work by engaging in criminal activities or fraud or deceiving people. You'll do something really stupid to sabotage your life, even if you are a da'wah, even if you're a teacher, you're an imam, a preacher, a surgeon, you're going to mess up. Your qareen will make you mess up because your qareen does not want you to have a good life. The mission of the qareen is to destroy people through you and then when that mission is completed, you get destroyed at the end of it. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warned us about in the Qur'an when Iblis said to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that on the day of judgment, he will step back from everyone who blames him for all of their sins that they committed in the dunya. He will say, it's got nothing to do with me. I merely whispered to you and you obeyed. Your qareen will say the same thing. He will land you in it, right? They set you up. And then on the day of judgment, they wash their hands off you. So these entities are your enemies. Okay, you cannot blame your qareen on the day of judgment for your actions because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you the tools to be able to overpower your qareen and actually take control of your life and be an empathic, wonderful human being. So again, I just want to emphasize that malignant people, malignant abusers are abusers by choice. It's not because they're insane. It's not because they don't know what they're doing. They know exactly what they're doing and it's a choice. Some people may be under the influence of black magic that makes them act in an abusive way or in a way that's abnormal. But this is clear if the person beforehand, before all of that black magic happened, was an empathic person. So that's how you know the difference between someone who has the disorder and someone who has black magic on them. Black magic makes someone turn into a completely different person overnight. Okay, they would have been a great person, they would have had a great marriage, and then one day they just hate their spouse. One day they just turn into a monster. That's when you know something's wrong and there's a spiritual problem here. However, if a individual has been problematic since childhood or since the you know the teenage years 
and they've gradually got worse, then that's the disorder. Okay, so black magic is something that happens suddenly and a disorder is something that happens gradually. It gets worse with time. And another evidence for this is that if you take these two people to a authentic and God-fearing Raqi practitioner, the person who has black magic will inshallah be cured of it and the person who has the disorder will not. Okay, so Ruqya cannot help someone who's got MPD because this is an internal problem. It's jihad and nafs. Jihad and nafs is a subject, inshallah, that I will speak about on another podcast, but it's inner work that has to be done in order for the Ruqya to work because a lot of people who have MPD are not true believers. And I say that because they actually are enslaved and worship their qareen and they worship their ego. And what is the evidence for this in the Quran? It's in Surah Al-Furqan, Ayah 43, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the Prophet Muhammad أَرَأَيْتَ مَنِ اتَّخَذَ إِلَاهَهُ هَوَاهُ أَفَأَنْتَ تَكُونُ عَلَيْهِ وَكِيلًا So in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu Have you seen, O Prophet, the one who has taken their own desires, their ego, as their God? Will you then be able to be a protector over them. So he is telling the Prophet ﷺ that there's nothing you can do for these people. So if someone worships their ego, it's the inner work that needs to be done in order for them to help themselves. And that's why I always tell people, you cannot save a narcissist, you cannot save a psychopath. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling the Prophet himself, you can't save these people. So if he can't save these people and he was the greatest man to walk on this earth, then who are we? Surely we cannot have that ability to save a narcissist or a psychopath from themselves, from their own ego. This is what jihad and nafs is all about. Jihad and nafs is the battle between your own nafs and your qareen. Okay, so the waswas that you get to do wrong is fought by your nafs. Your nafs is the decision-making hub. So your nafs is the one who decides, do I listen to my waswas or do I not? Do I do what's right or do I do what's wrong? So if your nafs is enslaved to your qareen, you're going to listen to the waswas. You're going to be enslaved by that qareen. And the difference between narcissists and empaths is that empaths overpower their qareen by not listening to the waswas. And that's why... You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us to read Surah Al-Falaq. Because Al-Waswas Al-Khannas, the evil whisperer, is your qareen. Okay, some people, you know, they say it's just Iblis. No, it's not just Iblis. Al-Waswas Al-Khannas is the evil qareen that has been assigned to each one of us. And this evil qareen is the one who has the mission of whispering and feeding evil thoughts into our minds. So I just wanted to start off with this. Because it's just to refresh your memories about where narcissism and psychopathy is rooted. If you want more information about this, please go to my previous podcast about the narcissists and their qareens and all of that. So I just wanted to make it clear that narcissists are delusional when they believe that this qareen who is inflating their ego and allowing them to be so powerful and so intimidating right and so controlling over others is their friend and this is why they always lose out in the end loads of people say oh you know they get away with everything they'll die getting away with all the abuse says who where are you getting this information from they always lose in the end because their qareen will let them down and their qareen will betray them so how can they ever get away with what they do when they believe their qareen is their friend? They live in a completely delusional life. The empath always wins. This is 1000% guaranteed. Guaranteed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that even if someone dies and they have been subjected to abuse and they haven't received their justice in this dunya, Wallahi al-Azim, you're the one who's going to win. It's guaranteed. There is no way Someone who is oppressed and abused will be the one who loses in the dunya and the akhirah. You will have your justice and the abusers will always 
face their fate at the end of the day, whether it's in this life or the next. Sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala delays the punishment of people until the akhirah because that's what they deserve, right? So the punishment and the horrors of the day of judgment and what they're going to face on that day is more befitting for them than what they could receive in the dunya. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you know, we allow them, we allow them to continue in their delusion until the day when they meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-An'am, Ayah 110, ونقلب أفئدتهم وأبصارهم كما لم يؤمنوا به أول مرة ونذرهم في تغيانهم يعمهون which means and we will turn away their hearts and their eyes just as they refused to believe in the revelation the first time and we will leave them in their transgression and delusion wandering blindly so Allah is telling us that these people are lost these people are delusional and they believe that they are people of knowledge. They believe they are practicing Muslims. They believe they are powerful Muslims who know the deen, right? They know better than everyone else. They know the Quran and the Sunnah, how it's meant to be implemented properly. They know the true Islam. They are the only people who follow the true Islam. But Allah tells us that they are blind. They're blind to their own delusion. And they go through life oppressing people and being so delusional because of the level of arrogance they have. So the distorted understanding of Islam they have is enforced on people, right? It's, it's enforced on their wives, their husbands, their children, the people under their care, their ch you know, everybody. And they ruin people's lives with that because they feel entitled to that level of power even when they know they're doing something wrong, okay? Because... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us all a brain and sometimes someone will be so strict and so extremist in their implementation of Islam on people around them. They won't implement it on themselves, right? This is another indication that someone is a hypocrite in their understanding of Islam because they manage to justify why they can't do it or they won't do it. They justify it for themselves, but they don't find excuses for other people. So they ruin people's lives with this you know, enforcement of their own understanding of Islam. So, for example, a psychopathic Muslim husband may severely beat his wife to discipline her and say, well, the Quran says that I can. Okay, he justifies his reasons for it by saying, well, you know, the Quran says I can. The Quran does not say that you can, because if you are a true follower of the Prophet والسلام, and you actually read the hadiths, you would see that he cursed the people who even hit an animal, let alone another human being. He forbade anyone from even slapping the face of someone else. He said that this is forbidden, it's haram, because of the psychological and physical consequences that can come as a result of doing something like that. But psychopathic husbands will find a way to justify it but deep down they know that this can't be from the deen they know and Allah says in this ayah that they do this because they refused to believe okay not because they're stupid not because they are insane but because they refuse to believe and the evidence for this is Again, another example, let's say a husband is beating his wife and he says to her, this sheikh says I can do this. Look at the Quran, it says I can do this. And then his wife will bring him seven videos of seven different scholars, and I'm talking about authentic scholars, okay, who say that the tafsir of this verse does not mean physical violence and they bring evidence from the sunnah right from the hadiths that it is prohibited to discipline anyone in this manner she will come with the evidence that the tafsir you know the interpretation of the of these quran verses are completely different from his understanding and he will refuse to believe he will reject them because they don't suit his satanic agenda 
okay? A lot of people, a lot of people will reject all the authentic evidence that you bring to them from the Qur'an and Hadith because these are not people who follow the Qur'an and Hadith. They are following the orders and the demands of their satanic qareen. And that's why they will always reject all the authentic interpretations of the Qur'an and Hadith that do not suit their agenda. They will even ban you from listening to scholars who are more empathic than the ones they listen to. And more often than not, it's preachers whom they listen to. They don't listen to scholars. And if they do, they will take lots of fatwas that were given by scholars whom change their minds about those fatwas later on. So they don't take the new fatwas, they will take the old ones in which a scholar had made a mistake. Okay, so scholars are not prophets. A lot of scholars made mistakes when giving fatwas, including Ibn Uthaymeen, Ibn Baz, loads of them. They didn't always give the right fatwa. But narcissistic and psychopathic people will hold on to the fatwas that were given before they were corrected. And they will just slam it in your face all the time. And they will call you a kafira if you do not accept it. They will call you an apostate. And they will call you all sorts of things like hypocrite. Oh, you think you're a good Muslim. You think you're a believer. You're not a believer. All these accusations are projections because this is how they feel about themselves. This is what they know about themselves. When people accuse you of being a kafir or a kafira or a hypocrite, if they accuse you of these things, of hating the deen, hating Allah, hating the prophet, and you're like, where on earth did that come from? When they just accuse you of these things out of the blue, or if you just don't accept one of their, you know, their understandings of Quran or Sunnah, and they come out with all this nasty speech and all these accusations, believe me when I tell you, this is how they feel about themselves. They are speaking about themselves. A narcissist and psychopath will always project onto you. So when you are accused of something that you know is not true, they're actually speaking about themselves. They're actually giving away how they feel about themselves. Because it's haram to claim that someone is a kafir or a kafira if they have not claimed it themselves. If they have not come out to actually say... I am no longer a Muslim. I am no longer a believer. Someone has to do that in order for them to be labelled as apostates. But if you do something that doesn't please the narcissist or psychopath and they start branding you as a kafir or kafira, they're actually committing haram. It's actually completely forbidden to do that. The same way it's forbidden to accuse people of major sins, such as adultery. Okay, You shouldn't be going around telling people that this person is you know a prostitute this person is a a zani whatever you shouldn't be saying any of that but when you have a narcissistic husband or wife and let's just say for example you didn't have a good past before you married them and they knew about it okay let's just say that you, maybe they engaged in zina with you before you married or they knew that you had been in haram relationships before you married them they will always bring it up to traumatize you, okay? So these are people who are supposedly religious, right? They shouldn't be doing any of this, but they do it to traumatize you. They will always say things like, well, I married an adulteress. I married a zani. I married this, I married that. Just to keep you in that low state of mind, that low state of being, so that you look at yourself as someone who is so unworthy and not loved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, so this podcast is about the person who comes across as being religious. They love to bring up your past sins. I've said this before in a couple of podcasts. They love to bring up your past sins. They never let them go. I tell people hundreds of times, never tell your secrets to people, whether you believe they're empaths or narcissists. Just don't tell anyone anything. If, if you've done something and you've repented from that sin, don't mention it to anybody after that. There's no need. Halas, it's between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why are you talking about it again? Why are you opening the file again to other people? 
malignant people, right, narcopaths, will try and reel them out of you when you first meet them. Oh, come on, tell me, you must have done something. You must have done something when you were younger. You must have engaged in a haram relationship at university. Oh, come on. You know, I, I don't believe you if you say you don't. And they'll just keep doing that and doing that until you're like, okay, fine. Yep, when I was at university, I did this and I did that, but I repented. And now they're like, brilliant. They take their mental notepad out and their qareen writes it down. Right, their qareen is writing all this down. These are all weapons that they can now use against you when the time is needed. And they use them when they show their ugliest face in fights and arguments. You will be having a fight about them cancelling a holiday for no reason whatsoever. Okay, now you're really mad at them for punishing you this way. They just come to you and say, I've cancelled the holiday, we're not going on that holiday. So now you're super mad, you're super upset. You're engaging now in an argument in which you are demanding to know why you've been punished in this way. Because what happened was not deserving of such a punishment, right? You did something petty to upset them and then they go and cancel an entire holiday. So you're arguing about this and then all of a sudden, out of the blue, they're like, anyways, I should never have married you. You're a Zania or you're a Zani, you know? I should never have married filth like you. And it comes out of the blue. You know how many people complain about this? And it traumatizes them because now there's another problem. You are arguing about this cancelled holiday and because the narcopath knows that they were not in the right to be cancelling a holiday over something so petty, they have to bring up something else to distract you from the evil they have within them. Okay, so they bring up something else. And what they bring up from your past is done deliberately to justify why they treat you so badly, why they believe that you deserve such horrible treatment. So this is one of the major toxic things that they do whenever they get mad at you. They bring up so much from your past, so much from your past. There are things I'm going to list in this podcast that parents do as well, um, things that I haven't mentioned in part one. I'll mention some here in part two. Um, but this is one of the things that they do. Parents will do it as well. Okay. So always be prepared and be alert and aware that when they do this, it's a manipulation tactic to traumatize you. They want you to always be reminded of your sins. Again, this is why in Islam, you're not meant to tell anyone about them. So unless you're going to like, I don't know, the police or a counsellor where you're in a safe space, the counsellor's not going to use that against you, right? A therapist wouldn't do that, but your partner could, your parent could, your siblings could, your friends could. Don't tell your secrets and your sins to people who do not need to know them. And another thing that they are notorious for is unbearable silent treatments, Okay, these silent treatments can last from hours to weeks. Weeks and weeks of silent treatments to make you go mad. And they do it to get away with doing what they want to do. Okay, so when they're giving you the silent treatment, they do it for a number of reasons. One of the reasons is that they can go out with their new supply. Or they can go out on the hunt for new supply. Because now you don't have the right to speak to them or find out where they're going or what they're doing because they're giving you the silent treatment. You're in punishment now, right? You're in, you're in this space where you are not allowed to ask them anything. You don't have the right to because you're in punishment. So they take it as an opportunity to go and do whatever they want. So even if they want to go and stay in another bedroom... And they do it for ages. They do it for weeks. And you start to wonder, does this man not have any sexual needs? What's going on with this man? It's because he wants the space to watch all the pornography he wants to watch. And if it's not pornography, it's so that he can or she can have the private space to be speaking to their new supply. And sometimes they give you the silent treatment because they don't want you to ask them for what you need and what you want. 
So again, because you're in punishment, they expect you to know that you won't get what you need and want from them. If they are a low level narcissist, then they will still do things for you, but you know, while giving you the silent treatment. But the malignant ones, they don't. So you could go without food. You know, the narcissist will not fill up the fridge, for example, and he will choose to eat outside so that when he comes home, it doesn't matter if there's no food at home because he has sorted his breakfast, lunch and dinners outside of the home. And when you ask these people, you know, to go shopping, do the supermarket shopping, they might go and do the basic minimum shopping. So they'll come back with a few items because it's not for him, right? He is going to be eating outside, you know, all his fancy meals and all of that. He's not bothered about eating at home. He will bring you the basic minimum. So, for example, it'll be like bread, eggs, milk, cheese, and that's it. That's what they do when you're in silent treatment. And they will make a big deal out of not giving you luxuries and sometimes to these malignant narcs luxuries are you know the foods that you actually like so in order for them to get away with their islamic obligation they will say i gave you i gave you your islamic obligation which is enough food so that you don't starve again you know they manipulate the deen to be able to inflict this type of abuse on their families. And if they manage to find a new source of supply, or they get back in contact with a back burner supply during this time, they will take it as an opportunity to inflict more punishment on you by telling you, I'm going to get a second wife. So unlike the low-level narcissist who will hide it from you, okay, they don't want you to find out because they don't want to lose you, they're worried about losing you, the malignant narcopath will just tell you straight. Because they know that you are intimidated by them, you fear them. So when they say something like that, you're too scared to leave them anyway, or they know very well you've got nowhere to go. Maybe you have a narcissistic family you can't go back to. So when they are interested in someone else or taking on another wife, they will just let you know about it. And they won't care how you feel about it at all. They will tell you, I'm talking to this woman and there's nothing you can do about it. Or I'm going to marry this woman and I don't care how you feel about it. If you don't like it, get lost. If you don't like it, you don't have to stay. Knowing full well you've got nowhere to go. Knowing full well that you are completely financially dependent on this person. Now, the malignant narcopaths know that they're going to be doing all of these things in marriage and that's why they forbid you from the beginning from working. And if you're working when they meet you, they will forbid you from working shortly after the marriage because they want you to be completely financially dependent on them. When that happens, they know that you're not going anywhere. They know that you're trapped inside this marriage, okay? And they will cut you off and isolate you from all your friends who do work, all your friends who are independent. And they will say, oh, your friends are feminists. I don't want you to keep the company of these women. And they will sabotage your friendships with them, especially if they are divorced. If you have divorced friends, they are the biggest threat to the narcopath because they worry that these women will give you ways out will give you ideas, will tell you to leave, you know, they'll give you that bravery that you need to be able to walk away from a toxic situation. So they will sabotage all your friendships and isolate you from anyone who is independent, or who comes across as feminist or who is feminist or supportive. So when you're with a narcopath, they will isolate you from everybody, including your own family. And that is why I tell people, I tell women, time and time again, don't marry men abroad. I know there are great men out there. I know there are empaths out there. But when you are required to leave your country or leave your state, so even if you're moving state, to be with 
a man whom you do not know, you've met him online, you've fallen for him, you think he's a great guy, he's managed to trick you into believing he's an empath, and you move country, wallahi, you're putting yourself in such a huge danger, because you've already done the biggest job for him of isolating you from your friends and family. You've got no one in that country. You don't know anybody. You're on your own. And before you know it, you're completely controlled. You're completely abused. You've been tied down to the civil laws of that country. And there's no way out. Okay, there's no way out. It's just become too complicated now for you to get out of that situation. For example, when I got married, I moved to Saudi to get married. And my marriage was registered there. When your marriage is registered in Saudi, the ID of the wife is connected to the ID of the husband. So now I cannot leave the country without his permission. He needs to issue an electronic permission for me to leave. Alhamdulillah, this is one of the great things that Muhammad bin Salman abolished in recent years. So women no longer need this permission from their husbands because too many men abuse this and imprison their wives. But back then, this was in place. And I was stuck in Saudi. I wasn't able to leave unless he allowed me to leave, to study and to visit my family and so on. So whenever he wanted to punish me, he would not issue the permission and I was stuck. I didn't know anyone in the city I lived in and I I regretted it so badly that I agreed to move to Saudi for this person because I was completely isolated from everybody. He did not even allow me to have friends in that city because he was so threatened by the women whom I liked the company of. So never do it, never do it. It's not worth it. It's not worth the risk. I don't care how nice that guy is. I don't care how nice the offer is. You are putting yourself in danger by accepting the proposal of someone who lives on the other side of the world. You are so much better off marrying a narcopath in your country than marrying a narcopath in a different one. It is the better option of two evils. Because they will abuse you to the max. I have clients, Allahi, they break my heart when they tell me about all the physical abuse they go through because they're isolated from their families. They live in a strange country. They don't know the laws of that country. They don't know their rights in that country. They've just fallen in love with this guy who's promised them a great life. You know, he might be a surgeon or whatever. And they're just like, yeah, he's going to give me the life I've always wanted. It's worth me moving countries, you know, to be with this man. And then you find yourself trapped, abused, threatened all the time. You have a second wife enforced on you and she's another narcissist. You can't do anything. You have no say in anything. And when you have children, they are used against you whenever you want to leave. So they will wait until they have a few children from you. And then you might ask for a divorce after child number three or four, and they'll say, fine, you go. You're welcome to go back to your home country. The kids stay with me here. You won't see your children. You think I'm going to let my children go with you? I don't think so. They're staying with me. And now you're torn, because now you're worried that you might never see your children. Or you're worried that if the children stay in the presence of this narcopath, then you're going to lose your children to this disorder as well. And it forces you to stay. It forces you to stay in that toxic marriage because it's just too much hassle to be travelling to and from countries to see your children and to make sure that they are raised in a somewhat healthy home. So there are so many women especially who are trapped in these marriages because they've had children and the narcopath is using the children to keep them there. They are threatening to take them away if they do not stay. And because they know the law of the land, they know all their legal rights, they scare the women 
into believing that they will just be thrown out like rubbish if they decide to leave. If you leave, watch. I have lawyers here who I know. I can get everything I want. They scare you into staying. They scare you into staying. And there's never a good offer. No, you have to stay in this abuse. You have to stay in this abuse and you're going to continue getting physically abused because there's no way out for you. This is what happens when you're married to a psychopath. This is what you're dealing with, okay? And they love it when you're on your own. They love it when you are a lone sheep. When you're a lone sheep, they victimise you to the max because they're cowards. Any man who does this to a woman is a coward. He's weak. He's enslaved to his qareen. He's a miskin, right? You don't fear these people. These are masakin. These are people who need psychiatric help. They need an exorcism. Yeah? These are not people whom you should fear. But because of their intimidation and physical violence, you fear them. And they become dangerous people to be around. Like the parents I spoke about in my previous podcast, they may threaten to kill you if you leave. They may threaten to break your bones, send you to hospital, send you to a psychiatric ward. They might threaten you with that. They might say, if you do not stop demanding a divorce and threatening me with the police, or if you go to the police again after I hit you, I'm going to create a report and get you sent to a psychiatric ward where you will get sectioned. Or I will do something to deport you from this country. And if if you get deported, you will never see your children again. They will threaten you with things like that. And sometimes they mean it. Sometimes they actually do it. I know a woman, a revert actually, unfortunately, who was deported from Saudi because he recorded her reactive abuse whenever, you know, she she had her moments of insanity when he drove her crazy. He would record them and he would take those to court and the court actually ruled in his favour and he did her something called khuruj nahai. Khuruj nahai is when you terminate the residency of your husband or wife who is not Saudi. And when you terminate their residency, they're not allowed back into the country. And he's got children from her. And she went through such trauma, she actually did have to get psychiatric help. Because she kept having breakdowns. She wasn't able to see her children for years. She had to get the British consulate involved, the embassy got involved. It was a massive ordeal for her to have contact with her children again. This is what narcopaths do. And because they're known people in society, because this person might be an imam, a preacher, a surgeon, a barrister, people in society don't want to get on their bad side. So they find it very difficult to believe that such a person could do something like that. So they believe their story about the crazy ex right, or the crazy wife, or the crazy husband, women do this as well, when I, again, when I talk about men, I'm talking about women too, women are also capable of this, do you know how many men who are stuck in foreign countries, because they are so terrified for their kids, again, he might have traveled abroad to be with a woman, find out that she's a psychopath, she's a narcopath, And she does the same thing to him. She traps him there with children. And he's unable to leave that country because he doesn't want to lose his children. And going through court in a country that's not your own is very stressful. It's extremely stressful. You don't want to be going through that. This is what a narcopath will put you through. And they'll put you through all sorts of accusations. They will always bring up disgusting cases against you that are not true right they file false allegations against you and you feel very vulnerable in a foreign country fighting your case and they will deplete you of all finances because you will be trying to find good lawyers out there who will not scam you as well there are narc lawyers who will scam you that alone is a stress but you will be stressing over obtaining your rights in a foreign country 
So even if you're not in a foreign country, they will still do that in a country that you live in, that you are familiar with. It's what they put you through. Going to court with a narc is one of the worst experiences you will ever have. They will lie through their teeth. False accusations. They will drag your reputation through the mud. They will lie so much about what you've done. I know people who are people of knowledge, right? Students of knowledge. These are people who have a lot of, you know, respect in their communities and they falsely accuse their wives of adultery in court just to get revenge at them for demanding a divorce. There are narcopaths who have divorced their wives 10 times, 10 times. But in the court, they say she's lying. I didn't do that. And if I did, it was out of anger. But most often than not, they just deny it and they say, I never did that. So the marriage is now invalid, right? There's been 10 talaqs. It's haram for him to be with her. So when she takes him to court to get the divorce finalised and authorised, he has a fit over it in the court and he says, no, I don't agree to this. She's still my wife. And he will slander the sheikh if he gives her a fusk. He will slander the people who have come to support her with this, who have given her the fatwa or given her the advice that, yes, she is Islamically divorced from him because those ten talaqs were valid. He said them and meant them. Okay? So there are people who believe that they can get away with things like that. Now, these people know... Three talaqs and you're out. There's no coming back after the third talaq unless she marries someone else first. But there are some people who claim to be highly religious, who preach in public. They divorce their wives multiple times and they still stay with their wives. They still get angry when their wife goes to get rid of him. And he will slander her and he will say to her, she's an adulteress. She's this and she's that. And they will swear on the Qur'an in court as well over it. That is what a psychopath does. They are really cruel in court. And they are really cruel when they discard you. They will discard you when they find a new supply. And they will kick you out on the street in the middle of the night. No food, no shelter, nowhere to go. They don't care. They don't care. If it's an narcopath woman, you may even catch her cheating. And she won't care because she's got her new supply. She won't care that it's broken you. She will have the audacity to say to you, it was your fault. What are you going to do about it? I don't care. Yeah, so what? He's been my boyfriend for the last 10 months. And they put you in a situation where you can't believe that they're being that bold. But at that point, they don't care. Because when these malignant people have a new supply, especially when that new supply is another codependent, they don't care what happens to you. But when the new supply is another narcissist, they hold on to you. Okay, so they will enforce the new partner on you. You will find out that they're cheating. And if you find out that the new supply or the back burner supply is another narcissist, they will not divorce you. They will hold you hostage in that marriage because they know that they still need you as their long-term source of supply because you're the codependent. You're the person who is the perfect victim. You're isolated. You've got no one. They've managed to ruin all your relationships with everyone around you. And they do this in various ways, right? They just do this in various ways. They might just forbid you from going out with your friends and family. They might tell you that they don't like the behaviour of your liberal family or your non-Muslim family or your auntie or your uncle and you're not going. They don't want their children associating, you know, with your friends and family. And eventually, you know, you just find that your relationships with them fade out because they, they also withdraw from you. They don't like your husband and they withdraw from you. They don't like your wife and they withdraw from you because they don't want to cause you even more problems. So... When they see that your wife has stopped you going to the gym, sometimes your friends will just back off and they don't want to cause you extra problems by, you know, encouraging you to stand up to her. 
So many men as well have been cut off from their friends and families. They've been isolated by women who are so obsessive, so jealous, so paranoid and toxic that you might actually go somewhere and find someone who's so much better for you. They worry about that all the time. They don't want you going anywhere because they don't ever want you seeing your worth. They don't want you catching the eye of someone more worthy. And they don't want you being attracted to someone more worthy than them. So they're always paranoid that you are going to leave them for someone whom you actually deserve and who deserves you. So they always want to keep you at home. They always want to keep you covered up, head to toe in niqab, head to toe in horrible clothing that's so unattractive. You know, they you might be a size 8 and they want you to wear a size 16. They know that specific clothes look really bad on you, but they encourage you to wear them. They force you to go out with no makeup on whatsoever. They do that because they're paranoid that someone might actually like you. And they don't want that. They don't ever want anyone to compliment you. They want you going out looking your worst. And again, they will use Islamic justification for this. Saying, oh, tabarruj this. And it's haram for you to go out looking like this or looking like that. I'm not saying go out in tight clothes and high heels and loads of makeup. No, no, no. I'm just talking about going out looking nice, presentable. They don't even like that. You might want to go out one day wearing a dark purple abaya and he's like, no, haram, you have to wear black. And if you don't wear black, you're a kafirah. You are rebelling against Allah and his messenger. And they give you all that rubbish. And they might even do things to sabotage your diet. Right, you might be on a diet, you might be going to the gym, you might be wanting to lose weight, and they sabotage it by always bringing takeaways, chocolate, and sweets, and and sometimes they do the opposite. When they know that you like these things, you're not on a diet, maybe you're in good shape, they ban these things from the house. They say, nope, there's no junk food in the house, no biscuits, no cakes, no crisps, no nothing. I know someone who is banned from eating biscuits. She's not allowed to have biscuits in her house because he says so. When they go out to restaurants, he orders everything for her. He doesn't allow her to choose what she wants to eat. This is a narcopath. He chooses everything she wears, everything she does, because they love slaves. They don't want partners. These people want slaves. They want to be worshipped. The narcopath doesn't want love from you. That's why romance and love and all of that sickens them. They just feel sick. You know, whenever you want flowers and romance and this and that, they're like, oh, God, pass me the sick bucket. They feel sick when you want romance. They don't want love from you. Unlike the low-level narc, the man-child, the woman-child, yes, they do want love and affection from you. But the narcopath wants to be worshipped. If you do not worship the narc, you are in big trouble. Okay, the narcopath wants you to worship them and that's why they're so obsessed about obedience. That's why they don't care about date nights with you. They don't care about going on romantic holidays and and days out with you. They don't spend quality time with you. They want you to worship them. When they say, do this, you say yes sir or yes ma'am. If you do not obey, you're in trouble. If you do not become as submissive as they'd like you to be, you're in trouble. You will get punished for that because you are there to serve them, obey them and worship them. And you're worshipping their qareen. Okay, you are worshipping this satanic entity. He or she is not willing to do anything for you in return. If they do, it's breadcrumbs. They constantly remind you that what you're owed in this marriage is the the basic minimum. You have a roof over your head, you've got food on the table, you have hot water, say alhamdulillah. More than this, I'm not giving you. You have this allowance, you have your bills paid, say alhamdulillah. In return, I want worship. You are lucky to have me, I'm your God. They walk around saying that. Wallahi, I'm not even exaggerating. I've heard it. They go around saying, I am your Lord, I am your God. And that's all they want from you. 
That is why they are so tyrannical. Because they walk around like Pharaoh. They are your Pharaoh at home. Because if you do not obey, you get punished. They will openly disrespect you. Openly wipe the floor with you. Openly humiliate you. They will call you the worst names under the sun when they're in a bad mood. God help you when they're in a bad mood. When they have their rages and tantrums, it is one of the most traumatic experiences you could ever have. And you're meant to cope with it and tolerate it and accept it because you're meant to worship them. Anyone sane would know that this is not normal behaviour. But they expect you to actually tolerate and accept it. And that's why their narcissism is more open than the covert narc. So these are still covert narcs because in public they give a completely different facade, right? They show people a completely different image of them as being kind, empathic, helpful, charitable, knowledgeable, professional, all of that. But at home, they're more tyrannical than other narcissists. And they are feared because they're so physically violent. And when they have their rages, even their verbal abusive rages, they are really scary. You see their qareen come out in full view. Full view. Like you literally see Iblis come out. It's not like the qareen with the low level narc. No, when you are dealing with a psychopath, you and Iblis come face to face. You and the Qareen come face to face. You actually see him. You actually see him. Because of how satanic these people are. They are satanic. They're completely possessed. These are not normal people. If you're a narcissist listening to this, if you're a psychopath listening to this, I'm telling you, you are deluded if you think that you are a normal person, that you are a normal human being. You are not. You are possessed by your Qareen. And in other cases... Worst cases, they're possessed by other jinns as well. More often than not, they're also possessed by the Ashaq jinn. Which brings me on to another thing. A lot of these narcopaths, especially women, they are magicians. Okay, a lot of them engage in black magic. It is these women on this level of narcissism who engage in black magic and many of them are magicians too. Like the magician is the worst. And I say that the magician is the worst because the magicians deal with every evil jinn. Every evil jinn you can think of, the magician deals with them. So they deal with the evil jinn who affect your health. They deal with the ones who affect your salah. They deal with the ones who affect your marriage. They deal with the ones who affect your sexuality. Everything. Every evil jinn you can think of, they have them in there vicinity so they're the worst of people literally they are the satanic worshippers they openly worship iblis people who are devil worshippers magicians um all of that if they're into all of those dark arts they are the worst of creation and then below them are the people who go to them for black magic or they learn how to do black magic on other people So if you know of anyone who does that, they are on that psychopathic level. They are a psychopathic human being. And they for sure are not believers. Okay, when you reach the level of psychopathy, you are no longer considered to be a Muslim. I only call them Muslim narcissists and Muslim psychopaths and Muslim narcopaths because they present themselves as being Muslim. But they're not Muslim. That's how they present themselves. So when you see someone who claims to be Muslim and they have a psychopathic personality disorder or they claim to be Muslim but their behaviour is narcissistic, they become a Muslim narcissist. That's why I wrote the book. The book title reflects these types of people who present themselves as having that identity. But a psychopath could never be Muslim. A psychopath could never be a believer. Even if they pray, even if they fast, It's a ritual rather than a belief. Because, again, they have a very distorted image of Islam. Their understanding of Islam is very satanic. It's Iblis's understanding of Islam. 
because his mission is to make everyone hate Islam. So if you make it an ugly religion, a tyrannical religion, a religion that's just too hard to follow, people will no longer follow it, right? And that's why the Qareen will attack people who are God-fearing. They go to those people who are empathic and have a connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Their mission is to destroy those people and turn the faith they love so much into a faith they hate, a faith they run away from, a faith they leave. Okay, that's the mission. So I remember about 10 years ago when I was doing my PhD, I was interviewing people who had come out of jail and they had converted or, you know, Muslims who had committed robberies and crimes. I wanted to know why they converted in jail and who influenced them. So I came across this guy and he said to me something that was really interesting and hilarious at the same time, which was the reason why he was involved in bank robberies in the UK is because he believes Islamically that it's halal to steal the money from the kuffar. So there were lots of prisoners who had been sentenced to time because they had robbed, I'm talking about Muslim prisoners here, they had robbed the houses of non-Muslims and they had robbed British banks. And they all justified it Islamically by saying that it's halal for us to steal from the money of the kuffar and the assets of the kuffar. So when someone comes across this explanation, what do you think they're going to think of Islam? Iblis is at work here. This is why we have so much Islamophobia. Because Iblis will work through the minds of those who are uneducated. So when Iblis is able to influence those who are uneducated about Islam, you get Islamophobia, right? You get hate crimes and people who, you know, dislike Muslims and they don't want Muslims around them in their neighbourhoods and they're hostile towards Muslims because Iblis finds them very easy to work on. The uneducated, the ignorant, the jahils are the people who are the easiest to corrupt because when he sends out his soldiers, his qareens, everyone's qareen, to work through these criminals, these Muslim criminals, it's easier for them to influence the uneducated. And that's why so many people believe what's on the news. And that's why we have such a big problem in our ummah, because so many people get attacked just for being Muslim. Because Iblis has managed to infiltrate the psyche of these people through these Muslim criminals. He operates through them. He uses them to fulfill his mission which is ultimately to make everyone hate Allah, everyone to hate the deen, and everyone to rebel against it. So, of course, non-Muslims are going to be disgusted at those Muslims who are jailed for honour killings and robberies and the rape of their own people. Again, I came across a criminal who said to me that it's halal for us to rape kuffar women and to marry them as concubines. I actually nearly choked when he said the word concubines. I'm like, you're on something. That's some special grade of crack that you're on to even be saying such ridiculous things like this. They truly believe it. They actually believe that the women of this country, it's not a Muslim country, are their ma malakat aymanuhum, the ones whom their right hands possess because... They believe that these are the women whom they've captured. And these are women who they meet at the gym, down the club, or at the local shisha lounge. And they have a nikah with two dodgy knocks in a car park somewhere to halalify this joke of a marriage. And then they say, we are ahl salaf I'm telling you, nothing annoys me more than hearing that. I have never come across a more problematic Muslim than the one who claims he or she is from Ahl al-Salaf. And they do these vile things. They are vile to their wives, their husbands, their children. They are criminals. 
They are fraudsters. They scam people out of money. They are criminal preachers on TikTok. How dare you say you are from Ahlus Salaf? Ahlus Salaf are turning in their graves at what's happening in their name today. I promise you, if you go to any prison where there are lots of Muslim prisoners, 90% of them will tell you, we are Salafis. We are from Ahl al-Salaf. And they are the worst hypocrites and abusers and tyrants whom you will ever come across. I also remember this one man I interviewed and he was in jail because of fraud. Okay, benefit fraud and things like that. So... I got his story from him and basically what he had done was that he didn't want to work because, again, his understanding of Islam is that Muslims don't have to work in a kafir country. It's the kafar who owe the Muslims, right? So why should we work when we can get taxes and benefits paid to us? So what he did was he pretended to be unwell He pretended to have epilepsy so that he could get a disability badge, so he could get a council flat, so he didn't have to work. He would just get an allowance every week. And by the way, it's these brothers, yeah, who want the four wives, the ones who are obsessed about it, the ones who continuously preach on Instagram and TikTok and talk about it all the time with their, you know, fellow narcopaths you know, just to add even more delusion to the delusional situation they're already in. And he said to me that he managed to do it by faking epilepsy. And I said to him, well, how did you get away with that? Because as far as I know, you know, they test you for these things. You need to have medical reports and and all of that. And he said that he used to take the medication for epilepsy that the doctors would give him and... He did that so that the medications would, you know, they would show in his blood tests. And he said that if they didn't show in his blood tests, he wouldn't get the benefits. He wouldn't be able to have his council flat and all of that. So at that time, he was in a hostel. And so it was a requirement that he takes the medication for epilepsy out of hope that he would get better, right? If he gets better, then the problem is solved. So... He said I would have to take the medication for epilepsy until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him epilepsy. Now he actually has epilepsy because he's been taking medication his body is not supposed to take. So he ruined his own health. You see how the qareen makes you sabotage your own life when you obey him? You've now sabotaged your life because you're in prison for fraud. And you've ruined your own health at the same time. And it's not just epilepsy that he developed, he also developed other health issues as a side effect from the medication. And I'm mentioning this story because I have clients who are married to men like this, who are involved in fraud and robberies and crimes, and they are forced to comply with what they're doing. And if they don't comply, then they're threatened with death, they're threatened with violence. So the codependent women are actually now reeled into the crime. They're reeled into lie about their living situation so that they take haram money. You know, the guy might be gambling. It might not even be fraud. It might be gambling. It might be, you know, the wife knowing that the husband is earning money in a haram way and she has to stay quiet about it. There are loads of women who are going through this. Because she's too scared to leave. She's too financially dependent on him to leave. And she's too scared to tell anyone out of fear of what he might do because she knows he's violent. She knows that he's capable of a lot of dangerous things. So innocent women get reeled in and dragged into crimes. And accepting haram money and living with that guilt of eating food and living in a house that they know has been provided for with haram money. And this can really cause a mental health and spiritual crisis in these women who feel like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to forgive them for it. Every time they go out or enjoy their time, 
you know, or eat the food that they have or enjoy the luxury lifestyle he gives them so that they can shut up, right? He gives them everything they want so they stay quiet. It makes them feel really bad. It makes them feel really guilty, but there's no way out. This is someone who is a narcopath. And a way in which these narcopaths scare their partners as well is, you know, by um, engaging in road rages. Remember what I said before in the previous podcast about their dangerous driving. They will put you at risk. They will put your safety at risk, your life at risk by driving like a maniac just to scare you, just to show you what they're capable of. They will give you these reminders every now and again of what they're capable of so that you stay quiet about the abuse, about their fraud, about their gambling and haram money, about their major sins, about all the prostitutes they're sleeping with, about the boyfriend you caught them with. Oh, they'll do all of these things now and again just to remind you of how dangerous they really are. They might even humiliate you in public. They might scream at you in public just to remind you who's boss. And you know these people don't care if you hate them, by the way. Don't think for a second that these people have dignity. When you are overpowered by your qareen, your dignity goes out the window. Okay, so you might question why someone would stay with you when they know that you hate them so much. They don't care, like I told you. They don't want love from you. They want respect, worship and obedience. And that's why they're such a nightmare with obedience. They're a nightmare with obedience. So they can live with you for the next 20 years and they know full well that you hate them. As long as you obey them, they're happy. As long as you worship them, they're happy. As long as you put them above Allah, they're happy. And when I say this, I mean that they might ask you to do haram things, to please them. This could be sexually. This could be accepting haram money. This could be forcing you into sleeping with someone else for their own sexual pleasure. Yes, I've heard this before. I've heard of a case, well, a number of cases, but this particular case, because she's a client, where she said to me, sometimes he will bring another man into the house to sleep with his wife because he finds pleasure in that. And she begs and she screams and she cries and she says to him, I don't want to do this, this is haram. And he forces her to do it. He says, if you don't do this, I'm going to take X, Y, Z away from you. You think an imam is going to believe her when she goes to him with something like that? You think it's safe for her to go and complain to the police about a man like this? A lot of women can't tell anyone these things. But this is what happens behind closed doors to a lot of women. And sometimes a man will do it so that he can elevate his position in his career. You know, there was a story I saw of a woman who narrated her experience of her husband who brought his boss to the house to sleep with his wife so that he could get a promotion at work. And even if there's no agenda behind it, sometimes it's just for their own sexual satisfaction. They have a fetish of seeing their wife with someone else or in a, you know, in a, in a degrading position or whatever. And this is not something a lot of women can talk about. There's a lot of rape and abuse that goes on behind closed doors with these malignant narcopaths. A lot of women get raped. Now, a lot of people might say, oh, there's no such thing as rape in marriage. Oh, there is. 1,000% there is. When a man forces himself on his wife into having sexual relations with her, and it's painful for her, it makes her bleed, it could cut her, it's a very distressing experience, that's rape. And a lot of narcopaths will do that to their wives. So, for example, the wife might be upset with him. She might say, um, I don't want to sleep with you. You know, you've been horrible to me today. You slapped me on the face. You verbally abused me in front of someone else. That was so embarrassing. I don't feel like sleeping with you. And you know what he'll say? He will say, I will take my right from you by force then. Whether you like it or not, I'm going to take my right from you. And then he will rape her. He will pin her down with his physical strength and he will rape her just to get his rights. 
And this is something, again, a lot of women cannot talk about. But it happens. A lot of women have reported this to me. And some of them have called the police. They call the police. The police turn up. And usually the police are called after physical violence or rape. The police turn up. And he just puts on this angelic facade in front of the police. And he will make up this story, you know, this victim story about, you know, oh, it was just rough sex. You know, he he was just a little bit too, you know, tough on her. It wasn't rape. It was this. And he'll like, I'm sorry, officer. I'll never do that again. She's just very sensitive. You know, she's her body is very sensitive. But, you know, I'll be more careful next time. Sometimes the police are like, well, you know, do you want to press charges? And he'll give her that demonic look. Oh, are you going to press charges now? And she'll be so terrified to press charges, she'll tell the police, no, I'm not going to press charges, it's fine. And so they're like, okay, so it wasn't that bad after all, right? Maybe it was in her head, maybe she is too sensitive physically. And she, you know, she just assumed that it was rape. So the police will leave them and boy, boy will she get every punishment under the sun after that because that was a huge smash to his ego. How dare you call the police? How dare you bring the police to my house? Now, she won't be able to call the police again because she decided not to press charges. So when the police walk away, he now finds uh, an opportunity to punish her even more, knowing that she will not call the police again. And there could be many different types of punishments here. It could be the withdrawal of money. There's no more money for her. There's no more going out. Some women get locked in the house. Yep, they get locked in the house. Some women have their belongings destroyed. Okay. Some women are stopped from travelling and some women just get long-term silent treatment or physical abuse and it's regular physical abuse or regular verbal abuse. If it's not that, it's a lot of spiritual abuse. Spiritual abuse that can happen can really cripple somebody, especially if you're a new Muslim. I had another case of a woman who had um, reverted to Islam and her husband continuously belittled her, made fun of her when she tried to wear the hijab, made fun of her when he saw her, you know, praying, made fun of her when she tried to attempt, you know, speaking Arabic or reading the Quran. He would always remind her who's boss. He would always remind her that she's the kafira. Whenever he's mad at her, oh, he will always remind her of her non-Muslim days. He will always remind her that he's more knowledgeable because he was raised as Muslim doesn't just have to be with a revert this can be with any muslim woman or any muslim man they will ridicule you and make you feel so small like you don't have knowledge that you don't know anything because they were born muslim or because they're older than you or because they lived in a muslim country and you lived in a kafir country you can never be as religious as they are but they're the demons and you're the one who's actually trying and if they have been helping you with like, you know, studying the deen or anything like that, they will always remind you, I made you who you are. Even if it's not to do with the deen, let's say a man gives you a decent allowance, right, as his wife, and with that allowance, you can go to beauty salons and maybe you get Botox done and all that kind of stuff. He will always remind you, you were nothing before you married me. You were a street rat. You were ugly before you married me. I made you into this. I made you a good Muslim. I made you look half decent. Because of me, you now eat decent food. You wear decent clothes. Be grateful. How are you going to show your gratefulness to me? Bow down to me. And then here, that's when they'll always use the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad when he said, if I was to ever ask a woman to prostrate to anyone, it would be to her husband because of all the favours he has over her. But this hadith refers to a man whom a woman would adore, absolutely adore. You only prostrate to the one you adore. And that's why prostration is only left 
to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We can only prostrate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So prostration is an act of love and respect. So when we do that in salah, we do that because we love and respect Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We want to be close to him. We love him. We're grateful to him. So these men take this hadith out of context and they use it to degrade and belittle a woman by reminding her every five minutes, I am to be worshipped. Again, we come back to the worship. These people see themselves as gods. You have to believe me when I say this. They want to be worshipped, so they will use and rinse these hadiths until they die. Literally, until they die. They will be 90 years old on their deathbed and they will still repeat the same hadith. And if you do not accept their interpretation of the hadith... They'll be quick to brand you, like I said, a kafira, feminist. Oh, the feminist card is a great one that they use. Like, they will use that left, right and centre. Oh, you're a feminist. I need to teach you a lesson. I need to knock the feminism out of you. Every five minutes, they blame everything that you do on feminism. They'll blame your mother for being a feminist and your aunties for being feminist and everyone you watch for being feminist because they tell you, you know, you have rights in Islam. And that a wife is entitled to X, Y, Z. Like, why are you listening to these feminists? Oh, you're listening to these things now. Banned. They ban you from listening to a lot of beneficial knowledge because it threatens them. This is why a lot of people have issues with women listening to Omar Suleiman and Mufti Mink. There's a massive attack on them right now because they're empathic and they're kind to women. So their teachings do not suit their satanic agendas, so they launch an attack on these empathic preachers. Bilal Asad is included as well, and anyone else who supports them. Any preachers who support this group of empathic preachers will be slandered. And you will not be considered to be a true Muslim by these demonic people. right? So if you follow the teachings and the lectures of these preachers, they consider you to not be Muslim because you're not following their strange interpretations of the Qur'an and hadiths that are being taught by the same types of people. And when you argue your case with them, when you bring them evidence, when you debate them, they're just going to a rage. How dare you? How dare you not obey? Why are you coming to me with a debate? Why are you coming to me with an argument? How dare you stand up to me? How dare you question my knowledge? Or even dare to tell me that my knowledge is not correct? Who are you? Who are you to come and debate me? You are a nobody. You are a nothing. Your Islam? Rubbish. Your practicing of Islam? You're a hypocrite. You're this. You're that. You're tahajjud. It's not going to go anywhere with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're going straight to hell. You? Because you argued with your husband, you're going straight to hell. I am your gateway to paradise. And if I do not approve that you go to Jannah, you will never see Jannah. This is not what the deen teaches us. The Prophet Muhammad said that if a woman fasts her Ramadan, she prays her five prayers and she guards her chastity and she's good to her husband, she obeys her husband and she will enter Jannah from any gate she wishes. Okay, this is not possible if you have a demonic narcopath as a husband. It's not possible. You will hate him. You will find it very difficult to obey him. You will find it very difficult to live with him. So Jannah is not in the hands of such a man. It's not possible for Jannah to be in the hands of a demonic person. This hadith refers to women who are good to good men. Okay, you have a qawwam, you have a wonderful husband who is giving you everything, the respect, the good treatment, your rights, everything. If you're good to him and you fulfill your obligations towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to other people too, you will enter Jannah from any gate you wish. But if you're not that person, then how can you expect your wife to obey you and be submissive towards you? There's actually a hadith as well in regards to women about the woman who prays to Hajjud, she fasts, she gives charity, you know, she does all the rituals, Hajj, Umrah, everything, 
But the Prophet Muhammad said that this woman is going straight to the hellfire. Why? Because she is vile in her language and in her actions towards her neighbours and the people around her. So she's got a tongue that people are not saved from. So if you're vile in your language, if you're rude, and you abuse people spiritually, physically, mentally, you know, psychologically, all of that, your tahajjud, your umrah, your hajj, your fasting, your voluntary fast, your voluntary prayers, all of that, it goes to nothing. It goes to nothing. So this hadith applies to men too. All that facade you show to other people, you show to the world that you are this, mashallah, pious, wonderful man who teaches the deen. You might be someone very well known, but you're vile to your family at home. All of that, you won't find it on the Day of Judgment. You will go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala very confident because you've done all of these things, right, in public. I gave charity, I fundraised, I did this in the mosque, I went to Jum'ah every week. I taught Quran, I did this, I did that. And then you open your book and you don't find any of it. And you say to Allah, where is it? I did so many things to enter Jannah, where are they? It's like they've all been wiped. All your tahajjud, all your qiyam on Laylatul Qadr, all your fasting on Arafat days, all of it's been wiped because of your abuse to your family. Because of how vulgar and satanic you were to the people I entrusted you with. The people who were given to you as a blessing to be under your care. Through these people, you could have entered Jannah. Through your care and love and protection of these people under your care who I blessed you with, you could have entered Jannah. But you decided to abuse them. You decided to be tyrannical with them. You decided to be their Fir'aun. You decided to be their test in this dunya. So this has now become your test. There's nothing for you here. You have no good deeds. It's all bad deeds. And there will be a long line of people, those under his care, and maybe other people whom he abused and oppressed, maybe, again, if he was involved in crimes, the people whom he deceived will be in line on the Day of Judgment to take their justice from him. So not only will he come, or she comes, with an empty book, but you've also got a long queue of people who have come to take their justice on the Day of Judgment. So there's nothing left for that person apart from Jahannam. Allah can't help that person now. They're like, you've got nothing, and you've got a queue of people waiting for their justice. So Allah calls the angels to throw him into Saqr. He says in Surah Al-Muddathir, from Ayah 26, سأصليه سقر وما أدراك ما سقر لا تبقي ولا تذر لواحة للبشر and I will send him into سقر سقر is جهنم and what can make you know what is سقر it lets nothing remain and leaves nothing unburned blackening the skin this is their fate but they're too arrogant to care. Way too arrogant to care about this. Because these people are not true believers. If they believed in a day of judgment that's coming, they wouldn't be tyrannical like this. They wouldn't behave in such a way. They would do everything in their power to not be like this. But because they don't care, because they're not believers, because they are people who worship the ego, they worship the qareen, they will continue in this delusion until they die or until they wake up one day and repent and that's why it's so delusional when they say that there is no jannah for you until they're happy and that you won't get any good in your life if they're not happy and another form of abuse that they might inflict on you is the same as the not parents is when they continuously make dua against you to scare you and make you panic so the husband or wife may you know, do it in a loud voice where they might say, you know, may Allah curse you, may Allah throw you into Jahannam, I'm not happy with you, I'm going to sleep, you know, displeased with you and all of that so that you don't sleep as well. Because if they use the hadith 
that the angels will curse you until morning if you do not let them sleep happy or, you know, sleep sexually satisfied, then you're not going to sleep either. How many people have had sleepless nights over this, where they know that the narcopath has gone to bed angry and now they're terrified of the punishment, terrified of the curse of angels, and terrified of all this dua that they continuously make against you and they'll do it in the car as well. They love doing this in the car because there's no escape from it. They want you to hear it. They want you to be in a confined space where they will say it so loudly and if you tell them to stop, they'll do it louder. The dua against you will become even louder as abuse. This is what they inflict on you. This is this all happens behind closed doors that people on the outside are not seeing. So when you finally ask for a divorce, people think that you are so ungrateful. Oh, he's given you this great life, this luxurious life. Or your wife is so beautiful. Or your wife, you know, your husband is a known person in society. Shame on you for asking for a divorce. Shame on you for breaking the family. Shame on you for bringing shame upon us. And it just goes on and on and on because they would never truly understand that this is what is actually happening behind closed doors. And like I said before, it can happen with life coaches as well. I know someone married to a life coach and he's like this with her behind closed doors. But he's out there, you know, helping people with their lives and their careers and their marriages. But his own marriage, he's a pharaoh in it. They don't see the type of obedience that they want in their home. And they say to other people, you know, women have rights and children have rights and parents have rights. But at home, they're tyrannical. And... It's for no reason at all. Sometimes you might ask them why they say no to certain things or why they don't allow you to do certain things or why they've stopped you from doing the things that you love and they just say, because I'm a man and I want to. Because I'm a man and I can. Because I'm a husband and I can. You don't like it? Tough. You don't like it? Not my problem. Or you don't like it? Go and argue with your God. Not my problem. I don't care. I don't care if I have to stop you from everything. I don't care if I have to make you ask for permission to breathe. That's what I'm going to do because that's what I feel entitled to. That's what I believe I'm entitled to. So ask me again why I said no and you're not going to like the answer. Ask me again and you might get a slap on the face. Dare to question me and my authority again. And you'll see what will happen to you. I can't tell you how much women hear this behind closed doors. And then you wonder why a lot of Muslim women become feminist and they hate men. This is why. When you've gone through an experience with a father like this and a husband like this, you will hate marriage and you'll hate men. And that's why you find a lot of women in their 30s and 40s, they don't want to get married. They might be beautiful, youthful, educated, everything. They don't want another Muslim man in their life ever again. And honestly, I can tell you that it really does, really does fuel that hate for that person in your heart. You can never obey, love, respect someone like that. You just hate them. You just grow a lot of unhealthy hate for that person because that hate will eat at you. You're now hating your life. You're now hating every second you have to be in that house with them. Sometimes my ex would stop me from doing things and there would be no logical explanation for it. It's just because he felt like it. He's like, he would always say, Kefi. Kefi in Arabic means, because I feel like saying no. I don't owe you an explanation. I don't owe you anything. If I tell you that we are no longer going to go out tonight, I don't owe you an explanation for it. It's because I don't feel like going. I don't care about you. I don't care if you want to go. I'm the man. I'm the God in this house. What I say goes. You're just a woman. You're a nothing. You're a nobody. I can do what I want whenever I feel like it. Every time he used to say that to me, I just used to pray that Allah takes his soul 
in any way, shape or form because I absolutely hated that man. Living with him was the worst period of my life. And I don't say that lightly. I've had a lot of difficulties in my life. But those were the worst two years and three months I had ever experienced in my life. Because of all the emotional, spiritual and psychological abuse that I had gone through. Alhamdulillah, I didn't get to physical abuse. But just those alone, nearly, nearly, it drove me insane. It's by Allah's mercy that I didn't end up in a prison or a grave or a mental asylum because of him. They just feel like gods whom you owe for no reason. They don't do anything for you. They do nothing. They do bare minimum or below bare minimum for you and expect complete compliance. Expect that you give them blind obedience. They want blind obedience. They don't want you to question them or ask why. They just want a yes sir or a yes ma'am. And if they do have to mention something that they've done for you, they would have mentioned something f- nice that they did 20 years ago. You know how your parents will always say, you owe me because oh, I carried you for nine months and I had such a difficult birth and oh, you kept me up at night. You were always sick, you were always this, you were always that. And because of that, you now owe me your entire future. You now owe me blind obedience. You now have no say in your life. And you'll be in your 30s and 40s. And they are the ones choosing your career, choosing who you marry, choosing what you eat. And enforcing the abuse on you. Now you have to tolerate the abuse that I put you through because... Always remember, I carried you for nine months. I paid for your education. I did this and I did that. They will always remind you of the things that they've done for you that they should be doing anyway. You don't owe them. They chose to have children. They chose to get married. Why am I now owing you? I don't owe you anything. I owe you your due rights. But you owe me my rights and respect as well. If I don't get that, I owe you bugger all. And it will just make them go into a rage. If you ever stand up for yourself against these people, like I said, you will see the worst rages. The worst. They will smash everything in the house. They will even harm themselves. You know, they might hit their head against the wall to scare you. And some narcopath women will actually cut themselves, take pictures of it, and then call the police and say that you did it to them. Do you know how many women do that too? They'll bruise themselves or maybe, you know, you try to save them or stop them from cutting themselves and harming themselves. So you're grabbing onto their wrist or their arm to try and grab the knife or whatever sharp object they're using. And in the process, you might bruise them. They will take a picture of that and they will go to the police about it. And now they have a police report for domestic violence against you so that later on in court they can use it against you. They have to do something like that. They set you up. They set you up. They will harm themselves and then tell people that you did it. They will show people a, you know, a cuts that they made on themselves or bruises that you may have accidentally given them and tell people, you know, he, he physically abuses me. So many narcopath women do this and they land good men into a lot of trouble. And in many cases, social services get involved, children get taken away, or he's stopped from seeing his children, especially when a divorce happens. A woman can use this evidence of a police report for domestic violence and all of that in her favour to stop a man from seeing his children. And this will be a satanic move because he's innocent. He's an innocent man. But she's managed to use this against him because she knows one day he's going to get so sick of her He's going to want out of that situation and she wants to punish him in the worst way possible by taking away the children. And this is why they pressurise you into having children quickly. They want children straight away. They want to get pregnant straight away and they want lots of children with you as well. You'll be going through the worst abuse and they still want more children. You will be asking for a divorce and they'll be like, I want another baby. And you're so unhappy, you're fighting like cat and dog. And they come to you and they say, I want another baby. I really feel like another child. 
And you're thinking, again, what, what crack are you on? What is wrong with you? To want another baby, and I've just asked you for a divorce. When that happens, they're trying to trap you. So the more children they can have with you, the better. It's an entrapment. Because the more children they can use against you, the better. The more children they can take away from you, the more pain that's going to inflict on you. So don't do it. Don't do it. Get out of that situation before you end up having even more children. And so many women do. A lot of women choose to stay. And then they get pregnant. And they bring another innocent child into this horrible relationship. Or a man gets repeatedly seduced by this Medusa of a woman, right? And he impregnates her. And now he is entrapped. Like, you've seen that she is Iblis in female form. Why are you risking it by continuing to sleep with her? Why are you doing it? It drives me insane. When I see people do this, and I know it's the trauma bond, I know that these people are heavily seduced and manipulated and they're starved from, you know, intimacy. And then when the woman gives it to this man, he's now jumping at the opportunity to finally get some intimacy. And then she gets pregnant. She secretly comes off her birth control or her pills and she gets pregnant. You can't trust these people. A woman tells you she wants a baby, she's going to be off that birth control. But you're so blinded by the starvation that you've been going through for intimacy that all logic, all reason goes out the window. And all you think about in that moment is your pleasure. And then a few weeks later, oh, you're going to be a dad again. Round two of even more abuse because now she knows you're even more trapped. This is what narcopaths do. I'm making this podcast so you can wake up. Wake up because we cannot have more children being born into these toxic homes. It's not fair. It's not fair that they have to suffer with a parent like this. And to witness abuse on a daily basis. They are being born into childhood traumas. The moment they're born, childhood trauma. Even during the womb, they're going through childhood trauma because of the stress the woman is going through, right? When you're stressed during your pregnancy, you're affecting your child in a negative way. They feel it. They feel it. They're going through that trauma. So if you're going through something like this, with someone like this, you really need to get help. You really, really need to get some support and get out. Even if you have to reach out to women's shelters or even men's shelters, if you're being physically abused by a woman. Yep, it happens as well. A lot of men go through domestic violence at the hands of women. They start smashing things. And sometimes they'll smash things on the man. They will throw things at him. They will break bones by throwing a chair or sharp objects at him. Domestic violence happens to a lot of men as well, but they're just silent about it. There are lots of women who punch, kick, slap their husbands. They get spat on as well. I have a client who tells me about all the physical abuse he goes through with his wife. She spits on him. And when I ask him, why are you still there? What are you doing In that situation, he says, I can't leave my children with such a psychopathic woman. He's like, I am terrified of leaving them with her. I'm terrified of what she's going to do to them because she abuses the kids as well. She's tyrannical when it comes to the physical abuse of the children. When she loses it, she loses it. He's got a three-year-old and she hits the three-year-old. And for that reason, he's decided to stay to protect them. But they are seeing their father being treated in this way. And the unfortunate truth is that the longer you stay with these people, the worse the abuse gets because they lose respect for you. And they continue in their ways because they believe that you're there out of weakness. They don't understand you wanting to protect your children because they don't have that protection for their children. It's a foreign language to them. They don't understand what that means. 
like I said, they can never be qawwamun. Al-qawwam, one of the, you know, one of the roles of al-qawwam is that he's protective. But if he's abusive, instead of protective, then he's not going to understand why you stay in a marriage to protect your children because that's foreign to him. So they just see it as weakness and the abuse gets worse because they think, oh, he can't go anywhere. She can't go anywhere. But it's your Islamic duty to get out of that situation and actually do something about it. Because if you don't, you will literally go through more abuse. You will see more and more sinister behaviour that will drive you absolutely insane. I mean, another thing that I've experienced myself and a lot of people have experienced is that they will, um, like I said, destroy your belongings. And this can be really traumatic if they destroy your laptop, for example, let's say you're working on a project or a thesis or something important and they destroy your laptop that has all your work on it or they destroy your hard disks or they throw your phone into the swimming pool or they might even sell your things behind your back. They might sell your gold, your designer things. You know, my ex, once I was uh, at work and I was running a photography company at the time And he was so envious of some valuables that I had. There were some designer dresses. And when I was away, he took them to charity. He actually took them to charity. And I lost it. I lost it at him when I came back home. And he told me with a smirk on his face, by the way, I decided to take those dresses that you had to charity because you don't need them. And he knew that those were dresses I really liked. But it was just a way for him to torture me. And if he wanted to punish me, so during the time I was with him, I was working on my PhD, I was writing my thesis, he would take my laptop and hide it in the house somewhere. Or he would lock it up in a room for days sometimes, knowing I have deadlines, knowing that I needed my laptop to continue my work. So they do things like that. These are narcopaths. They do crazy things to you to sabotage your life and ruin your life. And after the incident of the dresses, my sister actually came to visit me for a few days. And I said to her, look, I need you to take my valuables with you. She was going back to my mom's. And I said, take my jewellery, anything I had of value, my gold some hard disks, USBs with important documents on there, all of that, I gathered them and I gave them to her to take back to my mum's. And I felt better. I felt okay. Because I knew, I knew that the next step he was going to take would be to start selling my jewellery and gold and whatever, using the excuse that I don't need them, right? So I gave them all to her and I said, just please take them, leave them with mum. Anyway, after she left by about a week, he was in a really bad mood one day, really, really bad mood. And I said to him, what the hell is wrong with you? He's like, you tell me. I'm like, I don't know. You're always in a bad mood. What is it this time? And he said, where's all your stuff? Where's your gold? Where's your jewellery? Where's this? Where's that? And I said, I gave them to my sister And he said, why? And I said, because I don't trust you with them. I don't need them to be in this house. They can stay with my mum. He lost it. He absolutely lost it. And I wasn't so concerned at him losing it because by then I was so used to him losing it. He was always having tantrums over everything. What I was actually thinking about and what I'd realised was that he was actually keeping tabs on all my things. So normally you wouldn't notice that these things have gone missing unless you're keeping tabs on them, unless you have an intention for them. So he must have checked on those things continuously because he had an intention to do something with them. And then when he went to check, they weren't there. And he blew his top. And he demanded, demanded that I go and get them back. And I said, over my dead body, am I getting them back? So we used to have arguments and fights over things like that and he had nothing to do with them. They were not his rights. 
You know, if I had taken away his things, I'd understand, but these were my belongings. But to a narcopath, what you own is what they own. There's no privacy. They are entitled to everything you have. They can destroy everything that they want that belongs to you if they don't like it. They can snoop through all your things. Oh, they are the biggest snoopers, by the way. Um, my ex used to go through everything of mine. He used to go through my hard disks. He used to go through my USBs, everything. My folders on my laptop. And if he found photos of me when I was younger with my friends, I used to be a professional horse racer and show jumper. He would delete all those memories. He would delete everything trips that I went on with friends this is all when I'm not there or I'd be at work I'd be visiting my mom I'd be out and he would take that as an opportunity to go through all my things and delete my things and it was only much later when I would you know go through my hard disks and realize that these folders were missing pictures were missing so for example I wanted to show somebody you know some pictures from my show jumping days and And I wouldn't find them. And I'd be like, that is so weird. I swear it was on here. And then he'd come with that smirk on his face and he'd be like, oh, are you looking for that folder that had your, um, you know, pictures with your university friends and of you horse riding and this and that? I'm like, yeah. He's like, I deleted them. Like, why did you delete them? He's like, because I don't want my future kids seeing that their mother was a horse rider. He's like, it's haram for women to horse ride. Why are you horse riding? He's like, I don't want you being a bad influence on my children. I don't want my children to see that, you know, you went on day trips with your friends and all of that. All of that's haram, 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 haram. And I'm telling you, I was tested so heavily because it took every atom of iman I had within my heart to not kill him there and then. This is what people go through when they live with narcopaths, I was literally so livid and I said to myself, I need to get out of this marriage before I do something to him. He was so incredibly jealous, so envious of the life I had before I married him. You know, alhamdulillah, there was a lot that I did. I started a photography company. There was a lot going on in my life at that time. And he didn't like it. He didn't like any of it. He wanted all those memories to be destroyed. Narcopaths will do this. They will snoop in everything. But they will not allow you to touch their things. They will not allow you to touch their phone. You can't go into their laptop and see things. But because you are the one who obeys them, they are the one who have the right to do that to you. They always have to be better than you. So if you have achievements or you did things in your life or maybe you have a talent that they don't have, they don't want you to have it. They don't want you to continue things that you used to enjoy before. So horse riding was completely out of the question for him with me. He banned me from it and he banned me from doing just, you know, things here and there that I would have really enjoyed because he doesn't want to see me happy. Narcopaths hate it when you're happy. They hate it. If they see that you're happy, they will sabotage it immediately. Immediately. And I mentioned this in a previous podcast. You know, you could be out. It could be your graduation. It could be your birthday. It could be your wedding. Your wedding day. And they just see you so happy and it makes them really uncomfortable because they're psychopaths. It makes them really uncomfortable. They'll do something that day to sabotage it. Something will happen that day to ruin your mood. Or, you know, you'll just have such a wonderful day out. Maybe you do go on a date and you come back and they see that you're happy and you ask them for intimacy, for example, and they say, no, I don't feel like it. They'll create a problem. And women especially are notorious for this, okay? Narcopath women always use sex as a weapon, intimacy, all of that, women use it as a weapon. They will starve you from your intimate rights until you give them what they want, until you are back in their good books, until you redeem yourself. Again, it could be something so petty that you've done. 
For example, you might have said a joke to them and they didn't like the joke. And then they decide to go into a strop for hours and hours and hours. And it's so stressful. It's so stressful dealing with the drama of women. I know. Trust me, I know. Women can be a real pain in the backside. I really do sympathise with a lot of men who have to go through the dramas that women put them through. The psychopathic behaviour, the unnecessary silent treatments, the unnecessary punishments and withdrawal of sex from the marriage. And it could be for ages sometimes. I know men who have gone without it for months and months and months as a punishment for something they did. So they expect you to redeem yourself and that could be a very expensive redemption. It could involve you taking out a bank loan to redeem yourself. It could involve you cutting off everybody to redeem yourself. There's a lot that they ask you to do to redeem yourself so that you can just get your basic rights fulfilled. Sometimes, you know, again, financial abuse comes into play here. So a man will completely take away all financial privileges and he will have you begging for the 10 and 20 pounds because he won't put any money in your account and he won't allow you to have savings. Sometimes these men borrow money from you with the intention of never giving it back because they don't want you to be financially independent. You might get an inheritance from, you know, a parent or a grandparent and the narcissist will cook up a excuse to take that inheritance from you. They might say, you know, I really need this money. They might even quit their job to pretend that they got fired. And they'll say, I really need your help. You know, a good woman helps her husband. And you being the empathic woman will give him your inheritance to help him out financially. And he never returns it to you. You think he'll ever see that again? Not with a narcopath. He does it deliberately to always have you financially dependent on him so that you never leave. So any money they see you come into, they will plot and plan a way to have it taken from you. They might even say, you know, to invest it in crypto, invest it in their company, you know, to invest it in a mortgage so that you guys can get a big house. They're just stealing it from you. Nine times out of ten, you'll never see that money again. And if a divorce happens and you request that money back, they'll be like, what money? I never took any money from you. What money are you talking about? It's all in your head. Especially if you haven't written it down. Any money you give to anyone, even if it's your husband or wife, as a loan, it has to be written down because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us in the Quran to do that. Allah says in Surah Al-Baqarah, Ayah 282, يا أيها الذين آمنوا إذا تداينتم بدين إلى أجل مسمى فاكتبوه O oh, you who have believed when you contract a debt for a specified term, write it down. So be careful with debts, okay? They will punish you in so many ways and this is one of the ways that they just don't repay your debts. They might even heavily tease you with intimacy but not give it to you. They may taunt you about your insecurities and bully you and they may do things just to scare you so for example you know some people have reported choking and strangling and the person has no intention to actually cause physical harm but they do it just to scare you to show you again what their potential is what they're capable of and on an even worse note some of them may even taunt you into doing haram things and that could be taking drugs. I've heard some people say that their husbands have pressurised them into taking, you know, magic mushrooms and drugs and weed, all of that. And sometimes, you know, they've pressurised them into watching vulgar pornography with them. And if someone living with this type of demon becomes suicidal because they feel trapped and there's no way out and they say it, and anger, I just want to kill myself, then sometimes the narcopath will say, well, do it then. Do it then. Sometimes parents do this too, by the way, to their children, to their teenage children. They will actually come to you with pills, a knife, poison of some sort, bleach, 
And they'll say, do it then. Do it then. I dare you to do it. I dare you to take an overdose. I dare you to kill yourself. They'll give you a rope. They'll give you all sorts of things. And taunt you into doing it. Their qareen is making them do that. Their qareen wants them to push you into something like that. And I want you to always remember, whenever you get cornered by an archipath like that, when they taunt you and belittle you and pressurize you into things, just keep saying, A'udhu billahi min shaytan rajim Just keep saying it, keep saying it, keep saying it. It attacks their qareen. Okay, you attack their qareen when you keep saying it. Literally, it will save you. Just don't stop saying it. Because it will stop you from doing something you shouldn't. And it will control their qareen. So I don't advise you to say it out loud. If you say it out loud, it just makes them even more angry. They start laughing. Oh, you think I'm a bliss? You think I'm a bliss? You haven't seen a bliss. Let me show you a bliss. Don't say it out loud. Just say it to yourself in your head. Just keep repeating. A'udhu billahi min shaytan rajim A'udhu billahi min shaytan rajim And you will find that the situation calms down. And it saves you. It protects you. Because they will always hold you accountable when you offend them. Okay, so like I said, even if you stand up for yourself or you question them, they get very defensive. And they they just say to you, how dare you question me? How dare you speak to me like this? They get so defensive and it can become very intimidating. And it can sometimes become very dangerous. Now, another thing you need to bear in mind that unfortunately, a lot of this can happen to pregnant women too. And women who have small children and when they're breastfeeding. So they can go through all of this violence and all of this verbal abuse while they have children in their arms and babies in their wombs. I mean, I've come across women who have told me that their husbands have brutally snatched away a breastfeeding baby because she has not complied with an order he made at that time and tells her, screams at her, that he is the priority and to put the baby aside and to go back to breastfeeding once she has complied with his order. Sometimes they will do sick things like that, snatch babies off you even when they're breastfeeding. And unfortunately, a lot of women go through domestic violence while they are pregnant and sometimes they get taunted for having a abortion. So if a narcissist does not want another baby, maybe he's got a new source of supply or he's going to the back burner supply and she's managed to brainwash him into believing that if you have another child with her... I will not marry you. So if the wife falls pregnant, he will go into a rage and he will tell her to get rid of the baby. That's in that case. He will also tell her to get rid of the baby if she is the one who wants the baby. So narcissists will always do the opposite of what you want. So whenever you want children, they don't want children. Whenever you don't want children, they pressurize you for children. This is just an example. And so when a narcissist goes into a rage over you being pregnant and demands that you go to the clinic and get an abortion, or blames you for the pregnancy. You know, they might accuse you of tricking them, they might accuse you of being manipulative and all of that, then it is usually because someone else is involved. And they've given that man an ultimatum. And so it now becomes a crisis for that man if his wife gets pregnant, because he loses out on the back burner or the new source of supply. And this is where a lot of women, if they stand up for themselves and they say that they are not going to go to the clinic, they are not going to have an abortion, it doesn't matter if it's at an early or late stage of the pregnancy. Sometimes they might say to the man, it's haram. And he says, I don't care. You will do as I say, whether it's halal or haram, I'm your husband and I'm ordering you to do it. So lots of these psychopaths will order you to do things that are forbidden in Islam because it complies with their agenda. It suits their life. It suits what they want. So that's how you know someone is satanic. When they don't care about halal and haram. They will force you to have sexual intercourse during fasting hours in Ramadan. They will force you to have sexual relations while you're on your period. Women can do this too. Women will seduce you while they're on their period. Or during Ramadan. And they will encourage you to commit a haram this is how you know you are dealing with a demon 
because they will do things that they know break the law of Sharia. They will do things that they know will make you feel so guilty if you did them. So they like to break rules and they like to disrespect the deen and mock Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and mock the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because they believe that they have more authority than them. See what I mean when I tell you that they believe they're your God? This is what I mean. So they will get you breaking Allah's rules for them. This is how you know that they want a higher power and a higher authority over the one you worship, astaghfirullah. But this is their mentality because they're demonic. I honestly cannot say this enough. They are demons in human bodies. And so if they want to punish a wife who is pregnant, they might push her down the stairs. If they have to force her into losing that baby, they will punch her, kick her in the stomach. Do you know how many cases there are in women's domestic violence shelters where pregnant women have been punched in the stomach while they're pregnant? Just to, you know, just for him to get rid of that baby or do something to damage the health of that baby so that she needs to be operated on and have that baby removed. This is how sick they are. And this is what a lot of people are going through with narcopaths. And you'll get women who get pregnant. I'm talking about narcopath women here. They have a good husband who really wants a child. He really, really wants a child. And she finds out that she gets pregnant. She makes it known that she is pregnant. And then she goes and has an abortion just to punish him. And sometimes it's over something petty. Maybe because he didn't get her something. Or he said something she didn't like. Or he didn't get her the gift she wanted because he couldn't afford it. Whatever it is. She will punish him by doing something or going to an abortion clinic to terminate her pregnancy, just to break his heart, just to put him in anguish because she knows it's something he really wants. They will use what you want so badly as a punishment for you. They will take it away when they want to cause maximum pain. So you can never tell these people what you want and desire so much because wallahi, they will use it against you. So many men have gone through this, where the women have terminated a pregnancy or pretended to have a miscarriage just to punish a man in not giving him what he wants. And sometimes, you know, women like this will use pregnancies to keep a man in a marriage. They might lie that they are pregnant and keep the man hanging around for another two to three months. And during that time, she will be sleeping with him to ensure that she does get pregnant because now she knows he's actually serious about leaving. So she pretends to be pregnant and maybe uses fake scans from her friend, you know, her narcopath friend who lends her scans and other things that could, you know, fake a pregnancy. And it makes him stick around, okay? It makes him stick around because, one, he really wants this child, and number two, he doesn't want the child to grow up without a father in the house, and so she will work on him during these two to three months to ensure that she gets pregnant so that he's trapped, so that he doesn't walk away. Believe me when I tell you that these are their manipulations. And so he could have gotten away from her while it was safe to do so, but because he was deceived, he has now become entrapped by coming back and falling for that lie. So you better believe when I tell you that these are very sick and unwell people who will do all of these things. And like I said in my previous podcast, you know, they will drive like maniacs while you're pregnant. They will intimidate you. They will do things to stress you out so much to make the pregnancy as uncomfortable as possible. They might not even turn up to the birth to support you. They may not even look after you properly during the pregnancy. You're seen as a burden. They always remind you that you're a burden and that they don't want to look after you and that you're difficult to look after. They're never there for you. Sometimes you might need a back massage, a foot massage. They don't want to do it because they don't serve you. They are the God in that relationship and you serve them. So you'll find yourself going through a very lonely pregnancy and a very lonely birth because they don't care. They don't have that empathy to be able to give you that emotional support. And this can really traumatize a lot of women who go through pregnancy and birth, especially afterwards as well when these narcopaths don't want to get up in the middle of the night to help you with feeds, to help you changing the baby, to help you soothe the baby. Oh, they, will, they might even go to another room and shut themselves up because they don't want to help you out. They don't want to help you because you are only there to serve them. That is your purpose in their life. 
They're not there to serve you. When you have kids, you're on your own. These are the types of men who say, it's not my job to cook. It's not my job to clean. It's not my job to put the children to bed and feed them and bath them and read them stories. None of that's my job. That's your job. All of you now are in this home to serve me. So you do all of these jobs and I'm just here to be served and worshipped. And this is why marriage is so unbearable for so many women who live with narcopaths because they just don't get any support and no help. And of course, this goes against all the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad and it goes against the teachings of the Quran because a husband is supposed to be merciful, empathic, helpful and husbands and wives should work as teams. But in these relationships, in these slave master relationships, you can never work as a team with your narcopath husband or wife. It's always a one-sided relationship. You are the slave and they are the master. And this is why, you know, everything that is haram is applied to the partner and everyone else, but not them. So they always find excuses for their adultery. They find excuses for having affairs while their wives are pregnant. You know, you notice that they do this a lot while the wife is pregnant or going through birth. Because it's during this time when a narcopath cannot sleep with his wife and maybe he doesn't feel, you know, any desire for his wife sexually while she's pregnant and, you know, going through lots of hormonal changes. So it's these prime times when they go and they find new sources of supply or they mess around with the back burner supplies and it's zina. More often than not, they actually engage in you know, sexual relations outside of marriage and they justify it and they halalify it for themselves. Again, this is demonic behaviour. And they feel no shame for it. Remember what I told you, the difference between a psychopath and a narcissist is that the narcissist can feel remorse, but the psychopath doesn't. And that's why they don't care when you find out. Because if you're pregnant or you've just had a baby and you found out that your husband is sleeping with the back burner supply what are you going to do about it they know you're not going to do anything about it you're in need of them now you've just had a baby you're trapped and so sometimes they will enforce this on you to accept it you will know that they are um sleeping with other people or speaking to other people and it will really bother you but they don't care because they have that power and control over you and sometimes they will marry that person and They will not be fair when they are in a polygamous relationship. So they will spend more time with her than you. They will give her more, you know, provision than you. And they will do nicer things for them than for you. So I've spoken about this separately in previous podcasts about how they really cannot pull off polygamy properly because they're tyrannical, because they're oppressors. They do it deliberately to hurt you by not being fair. And they engage with other sources of supply when you are not convenient for them. So even during your 40 days of postnatal bleeding, that is when they are more likely to take on a a fair partner. And nine times out of ten, that affair partner will be another narcissist. Sometimes it's a toxic codependent. But more often than not, it is another narcissist. Someone vile from their same swamp. So they will enforce all the Quran verses and hadiths onto you but when they want to commit zina, when they want to drink, when they want to do drugs, when they want to commit fraud and all of those disgusting things, they somehow justify it for themselves, right? They find a way, they find a loophole to justify it for themselves and sometimes they won't even care if they make no sense whatsoever because these people never make any sense. You ask them for logic And if they don't give you logic because they're so enraged that you've even dared to ask them for logic and an explanation, they will give you a load of garbage as an answer for what they do. It doesn't make any sense. They just appear like the hypocrites they are, right? When they are trying to justify their oppression with Islam and it's like they're trying to decorate a cake with chicken poop. And they expect you to eat that. They expect you to accept that as something edible. This is how their minds work. It's complete and utter delusion. Their brains do not function properly because they have chosen to be this way. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he blinds them. He blinds them and he makes them deaf, dumb and blind. They become stupid. They become blind. That even when they give an explanation 
for their major sins or they you know they give an explanation for something that they've done something oppressive they just come across as really stupid because what they are saying makes them look really stupid and this is one of their punishments in the dunya where Allah makes them deaf dumb and blind he says that they are like the cattle they just walk around in this dunya like cattle no matter what you say to them they're just stupid they don't understand and what comes out of their mouth is just a load of garbage right it doesn't make any sense so this is again a trait of someone who has demonic possession someone who is operating from the orders of their qareen so believe it when people tell you that their super religious husband or wife is engaging in such filth okay if you go back to my previous podcast about the strange sexual fantasies and desires and activities of covert narcissists and psychopaths you'll understand what i mean Behind closed doors, these people who portray themselves to be so religious engage in really filthy acts. And if they can't do it with you, they will go and find other narcissists and psychopaths whom they can engage in filthy acts with. For example, anal sex. Okay, there are loads of narcissists and psychopaths who really enjoy this. That's if they're not covert gay as well. Okay, they're not closet gay. So if they enjoy haram acts sexually and they can't do it with you, and they worry about being exposed if they do it with you, if you go and complain about it, they will go and engage in zina with other people who will comply with this, because they themselves are filthy as well. They themselves don't care about the haram and the halal. So they go on the lookout for women who are considered to be very trashy, and men who are considered to be very low class, right? Playboys, trashy, and they will happily oblige. So as long as these people can find others to engage in these things with, they will still keep you as a source of supply. They have no reason to divorce you. They'll keep you there because you are a source of supply in other ways. And that's why they're porn addicts. A lot of these people who are engaging in zina and, you know, all of these haram relationships while they're married they are porn addicts and they watch the most vulgar porn. Like porn you couldn't even imagine. They are vile people. So this is what narcopaths do and this is why sexual intimacy with them is torture. Being intimate with these people is a form of punishment because it's also abusive. You're also dealing with someone whom you feel so unsafe being around. All right, so you've got to be careful. You've always got to read your athkar when you are around these people and if you're living with these people. I can't emphasize on that enough. And always remember that if you threaten to expose these people or they fear that they're going to be exposed, they will go into a fit of rage to try and intimidate you and they might even threaten you with divorce. Now, if they're in this fit of rage... They might issue a talaq, which is in your favour. This is Allah rescuing you, okay? Always grab onto that talaq. A narcopath gives you. I don't care if that person says he said it out of anger. Grab onto that talaq and get out of that situation. Because it is almost impossible for you to get out of a situation like this when you're the one asking for it. They will tell you, you're with me to the grave. There is no talaq. You will not get a divorce. And they will say very disturbing things like, you are never leaving me. If you ever leave me, I'll kill you. If you ever get remarried, I'm going to kill you and kill him. So many women hear this on a regular basis. And it scares women into staying with men like this. And narcopath women might say, if you leave me, I will kill myself. And I will do this and I will do that. There are some people who will even threaten you with the children if you leave me I'm killing the kids if you leave me don't blame me for the consequences that will happen as a result of you doing that something might happen to me something might happen to the kids you know you hear it in the news you've got to take this stuff seriously psychopaths are people who will set their own home on fire they will 
murder their own children. They will murder their own partners. Because you're the one who wants to leave them. So always, when it comes to dealing with an path, they are the ones who have to leave you in order for you to have a safe exit. Because when they brutally discard you, that's it. They go on to their new supply and they focus on someone else. You are no longer of no use to them. So they don't care about you. You're on the street. You're in a domestic violence shelter. They don't care where you go. You're in a hostel with druggies and junkies. Oh, they don't care. Because they have new supply. So it's safer when they divorce you. But when it's the other way around, it's very dangerous when you leave them. So I'm telling you this to warn you and to prepare you for the talaq that will come when they decide it's the right time. They will do it when you're at your lowest. Again, when they know that you've got nowhere to go. When they know that they've severed all your relationships with people. When they know that you're in another country. They will brutally discard you when you're at your lowest. When they know that you don't want the divorce. So they always want you to remember your place and that they're the boss. And even if you do get lucky and you manage to get a divorce, if you have children from them, they will tell you things like, you know, when as soon as, you know, your daughters become 16, they're all getting married. And you'll panic because you know the people whom their father will marry them off to will be psychopaths like him and that in itself is a stress or they may decide to punish you by not paying any child support it's these narcopaths who don't do that they will disappear sometimes when they find new supply you know like they might give you that divorce and leave you as a single parent as a single mother and disappear they will go and have another family with someone else and act like you and the children don't exist. You won't receive a penny from that person, even if they're rich. Because when they divorce you, they divorce the children as well. Right? There are people like this. There are plenty of people like this. And then you get the other type of narcopath who will just stalk and harass you after a divorce, especially if you have children. If you don't have children, you can get you know, certain things in place like a restraining order and police reports filed to protect you from these people. But if you're dealing with the stalker type psychopath, then they will send you horrid emails. They will never leave you alone because you have the ties of the children. And this is why it's so important to have good relationships with your male relatives. You need them as a backbone to protect you from these people in the future, okay? So I'm just making you aware of the dangers of having to deal with these people because it just emphasises the importance of getting a support system in place. Even if it's not your family because they're not supportive, get other people involved, get the local imam involved, get the local authorities involved, get the local domestic violence shelter involved. There are people out there who can help you and support you. You're not completely on your own, okay? Because, the, like I said, these people will do things like this. You'll just get harassed, and stalked, because they can't believe that you got away from them. And they want to always remind you, I'm still here. I still rule over you. I still have power and control over your life. I'm still not done with destroying you. My qareen won't leave me alone until I leave you destroyed. So you need support and help in place. And more than anything else, you need to have your connection with Allah in place. Because your dua and your prayers and your adhkar are what will protect you from these demons. You're dealing with a spiritual problem. So when it's a spiritual problem, you need your adhkar and your dua and your connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you don't have those, you're going to face a very difficult life. Because it's just so difficult and so stressful dealing with them. You know, even co-parenting with these people is an absolute nightmare. I mean, they may even go as far as to demand paternity tests from you to prove that the children are actually theirs. And you'll be a pious woman. You'll be a pious, loyal, empathic woman. But they do it just to humiliate you. 
I know a woman who is married to a preacher and just to humiliate her, he ordered paternity tests to check that his children are actually his, knowing full well that they are. But it's just a way to degrade you. Okay, it's just a way to degrade you. They will always find ways of degrading you. You could be you could be a surgeon, you could be a medical doctor, you could be an engineer, and they know this when they marry you. But they will make sure that all those years of study go to nothing when they demand that you obey them in not working. And you're like, well, you married me as a doctor, as an engineer, as a lawyer. What do you mean I'm not allowed to work? What do you mean you forbid me from this? And they say... This is my Islamic right. You obey your husband. And they stop you from working. And they stop you from pursuing your dreams. They will marry people who have so much going on for them in their life. And who have a bright future just to ruin the future for them. Wallahi, this is what they do. They go for people who are very accomplished and have lots of achievements. Because they have a joy in taking all of that away from you. And... Basically reducing you to a nobody. In their eyes, they want you to be a nobody. They want to be the ones who are the achievers and they want to reduce you to a nobody. And I find that this happens a lot when a husband or a wife are in competition with you. So, for example, you might be a medical doctor as a woman and your husband's a medical doctor too, but you're better than him. Right, You receive more awards, more recognition, you're the one who gets the promotions, you're the one who gets the, you know, the great job offers and he gets really jealous of you. He hates that you're better than him in the profession and all of a sudden he will bug you to have a child and when you have a child, he wants you to stay at home, he wants you to quit your job. He will do anything to sabotage your career because he is so envious of you that you're actually better than him at his job. So they will think of any way to sabotage your career and stop you from working because you just can't progress. You can't be better than them. I I know a couple, a Saudi couple, who came to the UK to both study for their PhD and the wife actually did a lot better than her husband. She was actually completing it quicker than her husband and he just put her through every shade of abuse until she didn't want to study anymore she was too stressed she became so unwell from all the abuse that he put her through that she just wasn't able to continue so she backed out of the program and he was so happy he was so happy when she decided to quit Now, he didn't ask her directly to do it. He did it in a sneaky, indirect way, but abusing her so much until she gave up. After they got divorced, family got involved. There was a big drama about it. And a divorce eventually happened. He issued a divorce out of anger and she managed to get out. She went back to completing her PhD and she finished it. And subhanAllah, she got a position in a university much better than his position and it drove him insane it drove him insane like how the hell did that happen not only did she bounce back and finish her phd she got a better job position than him this is the way allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches these people a lesson you think he doesn't teach these people a lesson you know the lesson that they're getting is that they're getting tormented by their qareen for not fulfilling their mission of destroying that person. So not only do they see their victim bounced back and did better than they did, but they're also tormented by their qareen and that's their punishment in this dunya. That's their punishment in this dunya. And Allah knows it very well. You don't see it. You don't see it. But that's what they go through. They go through spiritual torment. They're never happy. They're never content. They're never at peace. Because their qareen punishes them for a failed mission. There was a Turkish uh, chef who learnt how to cook from his father. Okay, so his father's a well-known chef and um, he asked his father to teach him. So he would watch him in the kitchen and he wanted to start his own business. So his dad said, okay, fine, I'll give you some money 
to buy professional knives and everything and equipment. And so he did. And this young man decided to open an Instagram page and TikTok and, you know, show his cooking on there. And subhanAllah, Allah placed so much barakah in the work of that man because he really, you know, he does a great job at cooking videos. And he went viral and I think he reached like a million followers and, you know, he was getting loads of money from advertisements and endorsements and collaborations, partnerships. And his dad took him to court. His dad demanded almost all his wealth because he said, because of me, you became this famous because I paid for the knives and the equipment. All this money belongs to me. He took his son to court over it. His narcopath father took him to court over it. This is what they do, guys. They get jealous of your success. When you are a normal, healthy parent or husband or wife, you want to see them do better than you. You actually want them to achieve. You become proud. You don't care if they do better than you. You don't care if they excel in their career and you don't. You don't care if they do better in their business than you. Yeah, you might feel a sting here and there, but ultimately, you'll be proud. That's my wife. That's my husband. That's my child. And you'll feel happy to see them happy. That's what an empath does. A narcopath is the complete opposite. They will want to sabotage all your success and they'll take you to court shamelessly over it because they're so desperate for money. They're so desperate to see you fail. And oh, it's just so exhausting dealing with these people. It really is a piece of hell on this earth. And that's why their torment on the day of judgment and in the akhirah is so severe. It's so severe. So if they go on to finding new supply, and more often than not, by the way, a lot of uh, men, they will find new supply by grooming women, taking advantage of their authority. So if he's a scholar, an imam, a preacher, they will often groom women. And I hear that a lot as well. You know, a judge or a sheikh will have a student, a female student, she will be young, beautiful, and he'll groom her. And that's how a lot of them get their new source of supply if they have a religious facade on. So if they find a new source of supply, that's Allah rescuing you. He's protecting you. This is a gift and a way out from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if they divorce you out of anger, that's a way out. It's a golden ticket. Again, it's a rescue mission from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't be upset. Don't be angry. Don't demand for an explanation. Just let them go. Let them go. So you can be saved and so you can have peace. Now in part one of the podcast, I mentioned that I would speak about the hadith and Quran verses about these people. So I just want to end this podcast with that Islamic perspective. I know that this podcast has dragged on a bit. I'm already at two hours and 11 minutes. But inshallah, I will try and speed through this so that you can have a comprehensive understanding of everything. So Abu Sa'id al-Khudri who reported that the Prophet Muhammad said, there will be successors after 60 years who waste the prayer and follow their lusts and they will soon meet an evil ending. Then there will be successors who recite the Qur'an, but it does not go beyond their throats. There are three who recite the Qur'an, a believer, a hypocrite, and an evil doer. Al-Walid said, The hypocrite disbelieves in it, the evil doer earns his livelihood from it, and the believer has faith in it. Okay, this is Sahih Hadith. So, who are these people who will appear after 60 years who waste the prayer and follow the lusts and face an evil ending? They are the Khawarij. Okay, so the Prophet Muhammad he warned his followers, all the Sahaba, he warned all of them at the time, of a group of people who would come out after his death. He mentioned their arrival and characteristics a number of times because... 
he wanted to emphasize the importance of knowing and recognizing these types of people, right? So he said, among the characteristics of these people are that they would worship so much that you would consider your worship and your prayer and your recitation of the Quran to be nothing compared to theirs. Meaning that their outward actions like praying and reciting the Quran would be on overdrive. So they will do it excessively to prove a point that they're pious, right? They are so desperate to show people that they are pious so that they can be trusted. And when they're trusted, people will trust them in business. They will trust them in marriage. They will trust them, you know, with uh, big positions in companies. Because people will be like, well, you know, they must be pious enough to hold places of authority and, and these special roles. He also said, they shall recite the Qur'an, but it will not leave their throats, which means that their understanding of the Qur'an will not go any further than their recitation, and they will not have religious knowledge or wisdom. So it's just recitation. There's no meaning behind it. There's no thought Right, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions many times in the Quran that there are people who do not think. He is always asking a rhetorical question. Do they not think? Do these people not have brains to think? I've given them brains. Do they not think? It's these people. They have no idea what the Quran means. Their tafsir of the Quran is really skewed and it's completely incorrect. He also said. They call to the book of Allah, but they have nothing to do with the book of Allah. Which means that their call is great. Their da'wah is great. Right? They go around preaching. Their da'wah looks fantastic. But their actions are terrible. When they go back home, they do not practice what they preach. Their belief is not rooted in their hearts. It's just in their outward portrayal of being religious. And then the Prophet Muhammad said, and that they speak the best speech that you will ever hear of any man when it comes to religion. But they will leave Islam like an arrow leaves its prey. Which means that these are the people who worship their egos. So when they leave Islam, they don't do it directly. But they do it via their nafs that has been corrupted by the qareen. So they now become people who worship their ego and worship their qareen. And that's how they leave Islam. And sure enough... Less than 20 years after the death of the Prophet Muhammad this group came into existence and they were called the Khawarij. The Khawarij are people who have deviated from Islam and they implemented a very literal and extremist sect of it. And this is what drove them into constant conflict and bloodshed. They would always fight amongst each other. So they would kill anyone who didn't believe in their extremist ideology. And many of the features of the Khawarij were, for example, they would pray so much that their foreheads would become um, stamped. You know, when they have that dark mark on their foreheads and their hands would be rough and they would be malnourished from fasting so much. And they considered anyone who committed a major sin to be a kafir. So if you drank, for example, if you drank alcohol, then you would immediately become a disbeliever and that you have apostated. And you need to be killed. And they believed that they were the only people on the correct path. They believed that they were the only ones who followed the true Islam. And that everyone else was a kafir. Right? If you followed any other lenient understanding of Islam or interpretation of the Quran hadith. You were considered to be a kafir. And another thing they would do is question the religious scholarship of people like Ibn Abbas, Ibn Mas'ud, Aisha radiallahu anha, and sometimes even the Prophet Muhammad they questioned his understanding of the deen. And these people would lack any true religious knowledge or scholarship. So they were really ignorant. Okay, They were so arrogant and they believed that they knew better than everyone else, including the Prophet Muhammad and they often acted without knowledge and insight into the consequences of their actions. And they always saw the need to openly fight whoever they considered to be an unjust ruler. So in Islam, it is forbidden to rebel against a ruler who is implementing full Islamic law. 
So for example, if let's say the ruler was Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, it was haram to rebel against him because he was known to be a pious ruler who did his best to adhere to the sharia. So the Prophet Muhammad said it was forbidden for anyone to rebel against a ruler who was like this. But if the Khawarij saw that the ruler wasn't to their liking, they would decide amongst themselves to rebel against him. And so their extremist tendencies were incompatible with the realities of life. And they showed a huge disregard for the maximum of Islam that calls for mercy and peace before anything else. So who does this remind you of? We are actually living in that time where we are experiencing the deen of the khawarij. And again, the word khawarij in Islam means those who have exited the fold of Islam, of true Islam, peaceful Islam, loving Islam, empathic, compassionate Islam. They have exited that because the harsh and extremist interpretation of their own works more in the favour of their own satanic agenda. And this is why I truly believe that the majority of people who believe they are Ahl salaf they call themselves Salafis, they are actually Khawarij, they are actually following the deen of the Khawarij because this is exactly how they are. This is their behaviour. And the Prophet Muhammad he warned us about these people. He warned us about the Khawarij. And these are the characteristics of the Khawarij. That they are so abusive, they are so harsh and tyrannical. And they are so far away from the deen. But it confuses everyone because they're so excessive in their worship rituals. And the Prophet Muhammad he warned us about these people because a lot of people will be deceived by them. They would believe they're pious when they're not. And they even believed the Prophet Muhammad to be even too soft and too lenient on women. They didn't like how he treated women. They believed that their understanding of the deen, the harsh interpretation of it, was more befitting to the way they dealt with women and so on. Okay, So they were highly misogynistic. And the Prophet Muhammad called them the worst of creation and the dogs of hell. This is Hadith Sahih. Okay. He said that if they were to rise up in his lifetime, he would have killed them. He would have waged war against them to get rid of them. The dogs of hell, he said. And if you listen to the stories of men and women who have dealt with Muslim narcopaths, you will understand the exact meaning of the dogs of hell. You would understand the exact meaning of who the worst of creation are and why the Prophet Muhammad disliked them so much and warned the Sahaba about them countless times. He said that the trials and tribulations that the Khawarij will cause Muslims will be so great that even when the Khawarij were defeated in the time of Ali radiallahu anhu as Khalifa, one of the men in his army said, Praise be to Allah who gave us rest with the death of these awful people. But Ali radiallahu anhu said in response to him, No, there will be amongst the loins of these people this ideology until you find that they will fight with the Dajjal himself. So basically, it is confirmation that these are the people who have a satanic agenda if they are going to be the ones who fight with the Dajjal. They will be on his side. And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa also said that this group would continue to come and go until the day of judgment. He said, there will come towards the end of time a group of people, young men, they have the most grandiose visions, they are speaking the best speech that you will ever hear of any man, but they will leave Islam like an arrow leaves its prey. And so the things that we need to take note of in this hadith is that they will be young men, meaning that they will be comprised mainly of overzealous young men. You won't see the old and wise amongst their ranks, right? These are the road men, the men who are spreading a lot of corruption and fitna and incorrect knowledge and incorrect interpretations of the Quran and Hadith in the name of being Salafis and in the name of following the true understanding of Islam and that they will have the most grandiose visions. 
and they have a dream of changing the world and be able to inspire other people with their knowledge and opinions even though they will be incompatible with reality. So think about the red pill movement, right? Think about how they're influencing men in a really dangerous way to corrupt them and make them misogynistic and treat women in an incorrect way that makes them abusive. And finally, he said that they will be speaking the best speech, meaning, as the Prophet ﷺ said, they will call to Islam and to the Book of Allah, but their actions will be outwardly evil and evil behind closed doors with the people who are under their care. And this coincides with the ayat in Surah Al-Baqarah from number 6, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا سَوَاءٌ عَلَيْهِمْ أَأَنذَرْتَهُمْ أَمْ لَمْ تُنذِرْهُمْ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ As for those who persist in disbelief, it is the same. Whether you warn them or not, they will never believe. خَتَمَ اللَّهُ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبِهِمْ وَعَلَىٰ سَمْعِهِمْ وَعَلَىٰ أَبَصَارِهِمْ غِشَاوَةٌ وَلَهُمْ عَذَابٌ عَظِيمٌ Allah has sealed their hearts and their hearing and their sight is covered. They will suffer a tremendous punishment. وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَقُولُ آمَنَّا بِاللَّهِ وَبِالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَمَا هُمْ بِمُؤْمِنِينَ And there are some who will say, We believe in Allah and the last day, yet they are not true believers. يُخَادِعُونَ اللَّهَ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَمَا يَخْدَعُونَ إِلَّا أَنفُسَهُمْ وَمَا يَشْعُرُونَ They seek to deceive Allah and the believers, Yet they only deceive themselves, but they fail to perceive it. فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ مَرَضٌ فَزَادَهُمُ اللَّهُ مَرَضًا وَلَهُمْ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ بِمَا كَانُوا يَكْذِبُونَ There is sickness in their hearts, and Allah only lets their sickness increase. They will suffer a painful punishment for their lies. وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ لَا تُفْسِدُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ قَالُوا إِنَّمَا نَحْنُ مُصْلِحُونَ when they are told, do not spread corruption in the land, they reply, we are only peacemakers. Indeed, it is they who are the corruptors, but they fail to perceive it. And when they are told, believe as others believe, they reply with, will we believe as the fools believe? Indeed, it is they who are the fools, but they do not know. And I just want to make a note that this ayah refers to those who mock the empathic scholars who teach true Islam. So they laugh at those people and they say, you want us to listen to these preachers and scholars? I don't think so. You are fools. You're all fools who listen to these empathic preachers. And they choose to continue in their delusional ways of understanding Islam. And then Allah goes on to say, وَإِذَا لَقَوَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا قَالُوا آمَنَّا وَإِذَا خَلَوْا إِلَىٰ شَيَاطِينِهِمْ قَالُوا إِنَّا مَعَكُمْ إِنَّمَا نَحْنُ مُسْتَهَزِئُونَ And when they meet the believers, they say, Indeed, we believe. But when they are alone with their evil devils, they say, We are definitely with you. We were only mocking. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذَا خَلَوْا إِلَىٰ شَيَاطِينِهِمْ Who are the shayateen? They go back to their qareens. Okay, they're evil jinn. They go back to listening to them and their orders. That is who they truly obey. And shayateen can also be shayateen al-ins. So devils in human form and devils in jinn form. And here we can understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be referring to the qareen. Allahu yastahzi'u bihim wa yamudduhum fi tughyanihim ya'mahoon. Allah will throw their mockery back at them, leaving them to wander blindly in this dunya in their arrogance and defiance. So these are 
prominent Quran verses about these people. Okay, I wanted to end the podcast with these verses just to wrap up the entire subject of living amongst these people and for you to understand from an Islamic perspective who they are and why they are so dangerous and why it's important for you to remove yourself from their presence if you are safe to do so and if you can do so. And if you can't, then you really need to protect yourself. Protect yourself with adhkar, with Qur'an, and with establishing a support system. Okay? So I'll end it here. I hope that this is a podcast that you will hugely benefit from, inshallah. Please share it with people who need to listen to it. And please don't forget to like the podcast, because when you like these podcasts... They really do influence the algorithm and they will reach more people in search results. And again, if you need one-to-one help with counselling and coaching, my email is below. Just reach out to me with a brief about your case and I'll get back to you, inshallah. If you haven't grabbed a copy of the book yet, it's called The Muslim Narcissist. You'll find it on Amazon and there are other sites as well who are promoting it. And the German version, inshallah, will be out on the 19th of January. So you'll be able to purchase that online. I'm super happy that that's out. And inshallah, the book will be available in other languages soon. So if you're still with me listening to this podcast, thank you so much for being here. The time where I am right now is 1.30 a.m. in the morning. So I really do need to wrap this up. So until the next podcast, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.